Okay. Good morning and welcome to the October 24th, 2023 Board of Supervisors meeting for the County of Lake. We will open this meeting with a moment of silence. And I think it's just hard for all of us to fathom the amount of human suffering that's happening around the globe and in the Middle East. And I know that's been our moment of silence for the last few weeks and I think it's absolutely uh, critical that we continue that today. Vice Chair Simon, would you like to lead us in the pledge? Yes. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any extra items that are not on the posted agenda? We do not. Okay. We'll move to number four, consideration, I'm sorry, number five, approval of consent agenda. Do we have any items that need to be pulled? <clears throat> Supervisor Spatier? No. You want me to pull one? No. <laughs> Can we all just recognize <laughs> that this is a historic moment? What did you see? <clears throat> you want me to just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any um, items from the public? Anyone wish to pull anything from the consent agenda? Anyone, in, let me get in the Zoom room here. No hands up in the Zoom room? Okay, then we will move on to action. Adam. Oh, go ahead. Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. So we have some time till our timed items. And we have no non-timed items other than our weekly calendar, so we'll do that. Who's ready to begin? Supervisor Sabatier? I'll just make it quick. Um, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be joining the fire chiefs over at the Nice Fire Station, if that's okay with Supervisor Crandall. Uh, then because of the COC, we do have a, uh, because of the continuum of care, we do have a faith group, and I'll be meeting with um, a church group for a luncheon to present to them what it is that the COC is working on and uh, looking for ways for us to collaborate, uh, know what we're working on so we can share our programs to those that we serve. Um, then I will be meeting with Peg to uh, resolve some stuff that needs to be done for Peg and also doing a tour of pump station number six down in the uh, gooseneck area of Clear Lake. Uh, that's something that we approved about, I want to say, three to six months ago, uh, and the installation is happening as we speak. Uh, this is something that I'm looking forward that we can expand to other pump stations in order to reduce uh, some of the nuisance that come from those pump stations. After that, Lake County Fire Protection District meeting will be happening, and uh, that will be all for that day. Um, I have a lot of different things going on on Thursday. I have a Hope Rising Board meeting that I will attend partially, but then we have a uh, food bank discussion happening uh, in the middle of that, which I have to be a part of. Um, I will also be a part of the jail meeting over uh, jail medical uh, data that's going to be shared with us from the third quarter. And then the Community of Care Strategic Planning Group will be meeting together that Thursday as well. And in the evening, the Innovation Summit that will be happening on October 27th at Twin Pine Casino, uh, there will be a dinner on Thursday night. And then the Innovation Summit will pretty much take the whole of my day on Friday. And I don't believe I have much on the following week other than meeting, uh, no, we have the week off after that. Um, I'll just stop there since we want to keep moving. 
Supervisor Crandall? All right. Uh, tomorrow, I'll, I'll probably attend the Chiefs meeting, too. Um, niece, and then um, I know I have a couple other things, but I think they're just with the uh, folks in the district. Um, next Monday, we have a placeholder for Congressman Thompson to present um, a check that he uh, uh, used for, a, I don't know what to call it exactly. I always call it the wrong thing. His ability study? Well, his, yeah, his fu the funding that he approved. Uh -huh. uh, either way, uh, he's going to present the check uh, for the Middle Creek restoration. So I'll be doing that that day. Um, let's see. East Region Town Hall, November 1st. Um, not sure what I have otherwise. I don't see anything on the calendar. My uh, EPA ad hoc committee on the 6th, the back here on the 7th for Board of Supervisors meeting. That's it. Who's writing down here? Uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, first five commission, uh, there was a uh, uh, retreat last Friday. I apologize to everyone for not being able to make that. I was um, immersed in another subject, but looking forward to first five commission tomorrow. Uh, Thursday at 4 p.m., the city of Lake Court will be uh, dedicating the new park and unveiling the new name of that. And uh, that's going to be a good event. So everyone is certainly invited to that. Uh, Friday, I'll be meeting with city manager Ingram uh, to catch up on some things. And then last night, did meet with Scotts Valley Community Advisory Council. Uh, went over many subjects, including uh, the draft regulations that we'll be talking about later today. And, and of course, I want to thank the state water boards for last Thursday's workshop here in the board chambers. And uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Sabatier, for also attending a good portion of that. And I think that's it. Yeah, finish up with today's meeting. Looks like we have a gender review tomorrow, depending on the day ends. Um, on Thursday, I've got to travel out of town. And then Friday, I will be at the summit also, the beginning at the uh, Twin Pine uh, for Adventist Health. And, and on Saturday, it's the Pee Wee playoffs here in Lakeport, so I'll come up and check that out. And then Monday, I'm at an event with Congressman Thompson at the Hidden Valley Community Service District, a groundbreaking event with Congressman Thompson for a project they have down there. Uh, yeah, same thing. I, no meeting um, next week. That's all I got. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I think a lot of us met with Senator McGuire last week, and it was really great for him to tour the home hardening program with NCO and understand exactly how that program is going to roll out. That's really exciting to get him involved in that. Um, Sunday night I was at the Cobb School Garden fundraiser and that was, it's critical for the garden program. It's completely run on um, funding and not supported by the district. So that was an amazing turnout. So I just want to thank everybody that put, put that event together. Tomorrow, I, well, agenda review tomorrow. No, no, but, um, right. <laughs> I was thinking of something else. I have an interview with um, Canocti Fire Safe Council at 9, then the bi-weekly meeting with Home Hardening. We have the NCO Governing Board meeting, which will take all afternoon. And then Thursday, food bank discussion. And then I'll be at the, in the afternoon, the, the Recreation Agency, JPA. <clears throat> and then we're going to go over to the park for the opening. Friday, I have a meeting with a constituent in the morning, tree mortality task force meeting, then the Soda Bay Corridor, and that will be at the homecoming game. Okay. <clears throat> Forgot homecoming. <laughs> Saturday night is um, the land trust dinner. I'll be there. Sunday, I will be in Kelseyville with a trick-or-treat Um from 10 to 2 for all the kids to come out and have a safe trick-or-treating experience. And then Monday, my meeting with C.A.O. Parker. I had something. I, oh, on the third, um, the 20-year anniversary for celebrating the Santa Rosa Geysers Recharge Project. Are you going to be going to that? 
No, I wasn't planning on it. Okay, well, I will be there. Um, and then that's the biggest thing I have going on that week. I did want to just share that um, a couple weeks ago, I brought up that the Fire Safe Council had gotten a defensible space grant and they are going to be offering up to $2,500 for um, low income seniors, tribal, uh, Latino populations and disabled will um, be eligible. The, the program is opening up now, but because there's a little bit of a lag in funding, Supervisor Crandall and I are going to be front loading the program with discretionary funds. I just want to share that. Um, we're each going to put $10,000 in to get that program up and rolling and keep it going as long as we possibly can. So it's really exciting. That's going to be impactful for people all around the county. We've had some um, input from property owners in the North Shore and in District 5, so I thought it was appropriate that um, we support that and look forward to a presentation from the Fire Safe Council in December. Did you have something that you wanted yeah. to add? Yeah, I forgot two things. I have a, I have a Zoom call with uh, Senator McGuire uh, Thursday night at 5, and then also uh, on the 19th, um, we did our first cultural burn on the Middletown Rancheria. We had uh, 76 participants. Obviously, we want to thank all the Middletown Rancheria tribal members, uh, Elk Mountain Fire Crew, Cal Fire, uh, Terra, you know, every group that was out there that helped. And um, it, was, it was a really good event. Jessica, I want to thank you for showing up, seeing the opportunity um, as we were doing it. Uh, very powerful to bring back the good fire on the earth. Obviously learned a lot as we're moving. I think they also, Tara had a burn in Potter Valley the next day, so they're off and running. As we've been talking about for the last five years, it's finally hitting the ground and we're doing it. And um, we achieved most of the goals. There were quite a few goals that they wanted to hit as far as burning off the slash and some other stuff uh, underneath, but um, also to see, I think it's going to be a strong winter this year. There are a lot of acorns on the ground, and um, it was a very powerful day. So I want to thank everybody for that, and um, more to come, because it is the way to bring back good fire, and uh, it was a, a powerful day. So I want to thank everyone for that. So, yeah, that's it. I just, I really appreciate the opportunity to share that with you and your tribal members and watching you start the fire with the torch um, was incredibly powerful and something that I'll never forget. Thank you. I didn't know if, uh, <clears throat> Michael, I don't know if you reported, uh, Senator McGuire went to the museum as well and the Supervisor Green and I attended. It was, uh, it was really, uh, I think it was really good. We had two elders, or three elders there, two elders? Two elders, it was Ron and um, uh, Leslie. And um, just, educating him on a lot of Lake County uh, history with POMOs, uh, POMO natives, and um, the um, potential uh, enhancement of some of our uh, museums and areas to hold our ancient artifacts and whatnot, um, letting him know um, specific histories and like how, how the POMO were, had an education, or not education, I'm sorry, we had a monetary system and things like that. He was really impressed. He didn't know a lot of these things. So it was really, really fun to let him know these things and educate him on that. So I don't know if you wanted to add to it, Supervisor Green. No, it's just I appreciated the visit. And I, I know he did get some takeaways from that. And um, uh, just for me, the little bit of education we were able to do about the Clear Lake Hitch, which is featured in that exhibit. But what was striking to me is, how much important work is being done uh, in the here and now and for the future. And as important as museum exhibits are, I think it's even more important to make sure that we uh, uh, take appropriate action. So it's not all history. It, it's more about living history and, and reinventing what, uh, you know, this symbiotic relationship is between our native peoples and, and, and the rest of us. So uh, it was a good visit. And I, t I t had some takeaways too. All right, I think we are ready to proceed with our timed items. 6.1, a.m. public input. Do we have anyone in the chambers who is here that wishes to give public input? I'm not seeing anyone, so I'll check the Zoom yeah. room. Oh, you do. Oh, come on up. And you'll uh, just state your name, and you'll have three minutes. Good morning. My name is Zachary Ray, uh, father of two, uh, Wylick and Pomo from Yimaba. 
It's the Scotts Valley Band of Pomo Indians here in, in Lakeport. Um, former uh, Tribal TANF Executive Director, Consultant for Community Action Agencies, Board Member on Hope Rising, um, Resident, Volunteer, and Coach in Kelseyville. Um, I was part of the LA Commission um, in 2017 that removed uh, Christopher Columbus and was the first city to begin Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, that involved removing all of the statues and monuments um, to people that committed genocide, rape, and enslavement in, uh, in this country, um, and that spread across the country. Um, I come to you today as uh, asking two things. Um, one is to remove the monument that has Kelsey and Stone at Bell Hill Road in Kelseyville. Um, the monument there, the historical marker, is whitewashed and talks about how the Indians were the bad guys. Um, it doesn't talk about uh, the slavery, the rape, and the genocide that took place against our people um, and the resulting Bloody Island Massacre after their deaths. And two, I ask that uh, the, the city of Kelseyville be renamed. Um, it's a constant reminder of, of the atrocities that took place here against our people. And, uh, and, and working and, and coaching in Kelseyville is difficult. Um, with the recent change from the Kelseyville Indians to the Kelseyville Knights, I still have to constantly fight um, with the residents in Kelseyville who still wear their Kelseyville Indians, who still walk around and, and it's extremely derogatory um, and discriminatory against our people. Um, and so I think that the changing of the name would be extremely beneficial to the healing of the community and it's a needed um, change that's well past due. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who wishes to give public comment? I'm not seeing anyone in the Zoom room. Oh, we have a hand up. Dr. Ryan Ava, Ava, Ava. You can unmute and have, state your name and have three minutes. Good morning, I'm Dr. Ryan Ava, uh, the former uh, executive director of Sunrise and the current executive director for Blue Horizons Foundation. I uh, just wanted to uh, express my sincere gratitude to the Board of Supervisors, uh, to the Continuum of Care uh, and Behavior Health, uh, especially Director Elise, uh, Supervisor Sabatier, Supervisor Green. Uh, they have been a tremendous help in the past uh, month, specifically uh, helping us to create a solution to continue the interim shelter uh, in the interim time as RCS is getting uh, ready to, to take over. So uh, I just wanted to point it out that it would have not been possible without their contribution. So uh, greatly appreciate it. And also thanks uh, to the board for taking the time to review the contract and, and giving us the opportunity to, uh, to serve the community. Mm. Thank you. Right, so that's actually uh, one of the items on the agenda. That is correct. Uh, right, and just so this is public input you. that's um, us outside and apart from agenda items. So if you'd like to call back in, we can have of that course. conversation a little bit later. Okay, thank you. All right, not seeing any more public input. I will close public input and we will move on to our 6.2 item who's been very patient, 9.07 a.m. Pet of the Week. Good morning, I am Officer Sadie Egan with Lake County Animal Care and Control, and today with me we have the Pet of the Week, it is Rusty. He is in Kennel 25. He is a two-year-old Australian blue healer. He loves people and he gets along with almost all other dogs. He came in as a stray uh, from Jerusalem grade. He has been with us for a while. He is already neutered and he is looking for his forever home. If anybody is interested in adopting Rusty or any of our other shelter animals, we are located at 4949 Hellbush Drive in Lakeport. Our phone number is 263-0278. Thank you. Thank you for coming in, Rusty. Okay. 
6.3908 a.m. New and noteworthy at the library. And we have Director Veach. Thank you. So yeah, I'm Christopher Veach, County Librarian. And thank you for giving me just a few minutes to talk about what's new and noteworthy at the library. This month, I wanted to highlight a new historical fiction title that's incredibly popular at the library. It's called The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride. And the author, James McBride, is a journalist and jazz musician and is renowned for his memoir, The Color of Water, where he describes his upbringing as the child of a black reverend and a white Jewish mother. But The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store, which is historical fiction, um, is about uh, a town in uh, Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And reviewer Irene Katz Connolly states, the author's interest in personal and national history get grounds his meticulously researched new novel. The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store takes place in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, a rural community not unlike the southern towns in which his mothers grew up. As the book begins in the 1920s, the town's black and Jewish communities live more or less in harmony in the rundown neighborhood of Chicken Hill. They endure linked but distinctly different forms of discrimination from the town's founding fathers, all of whom seem to believe they're descended from Mayflower settlers. When the state decides to institutionalize a deaf black boy loved in the community, all of the characters in the book come together to protect him. And many reviewers are calling this novel the next great American novel, which is a term for, for books that reveal something important about our history here in the United States. And in an interview, James McBride himself replied to that, saying, if I thought I was sitting down to write the, the great American novel, I could never do it. I'm not that smart. I just wanted to write a good story that touched on things people don't know much about. So this book is incredibly popular in the Tri-County area with over 700 people waiting across all formats of this title. But um, you can wait for it too. Um, this book we have available in print and as an audiobook and an ebook. And you can request, request titles through our online library catalog, which has the combined resources of Lake, Sonoma, and Mendocino County library systems. And requesting items is completely free to library patrons, and items are sent to your local branch for you to pick up. Also, on your agenda day, I saw Operation Greenlight, and with Veterans Day approaching, I wanted to highlight the library's VetNow service. VetNow is a website where you can access for free with a Lake County Library card assistance for, for veterans. VetNow allows veterans to access live tutors in math, science, and other subjects, as well as standardized tests. And live online help is available every day from 1 p.m. to 10 p.m. And it also has benefits assistance and job tools, which includes real-time interview practice, a resume lab, and you can access this anywhere you can access the web. So you can access VetNow and all of our other services and events at our website at library.lakecountyca.gov or visit your local library branch in Lakeport, Clear Lake, Middletown, or Upper Lake. Thanks again for listening to what's new and noteworthy at the library. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any questions or comments for Director Veach? Any public comment? Okay, not seeing any. Then we will move on to our 6.4 item, 915 presentation on CalWORKS outcome and accountability review Cal or presentation by Social Services Employment Services Program Manager Teresa Schoen. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's big. So um, I am the program manager over the welfare to work programs at Employment Services. And um, I've been with the county for almost 15 years now, nine of which have been with Employment Services and the welfare to work programs. So I'm here today to talk about this new program. CalOR is the acronym, and it stands for CalWORKS Outcome and Accountability Review Program. So as most of you know, CalWORKS is the cash aid program in the county. It's um, our version of TANF, which is the Federal Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. 
So CalWORKs provides cash assistance, but one of the requirements is that since 1996, um, there are work requirements in order to continue receiving your cash aid. So it's time limited, it's 60 months or five years that an adult can receive cash aid. And um, there's never been a good way to measure the effectiveness of the program. Um, so the only thing we've had until now is WPR, which is the work participation rate. So when we decide what is success in our program, um, the work participation rate is simply a measure of how many hours a family is participating in the program. It depends on whether you're a single parent, two parent family, or in the age of your children, what your hourly requirements are. So with WPR, we're just measuring a point in time. It's not indicative of the quality of the services we provide. So WPR would be like, schools measuring the success of their education programs by the days children in school instead of looking at report cards or outcomes after kids graduate. So we wanted to find better ways to measure what we're doing. So this is how CalOR came to be. So WPR, if you are a single parent with a child, um, a child under six who's not in school yet, your participation is 20 hours a week in activities that are geared to help you become self-sufficient. Those activities could be further education, it could be um, work experience, it could be a number of things. Behavioral health, if you have barriers to employment, if you are experiencing DV, we need to solve those issues so that you are solid and on your feet so that you can take a job and keep it. If you're a two-parent family, um, the weekly requirement would be 35 hours, that which could be split between the two parents. And the 90%, you know, having nine out of 10 families meet that hourly requirement is really unreachable. Um, it's not a goal we will ever be able to meet. So looking at what matters most, it's our clients. It is what is the difference we are making for people in the program. So we wanted to find measures that matter. So looking at the things that matter, when a client is off cash aid, are they better off than they were before they were on the program? Are they more educated? Are they making more money? Are they self-sufficient? What tangible data can we gather that will tell us how we're doing? So with CalOR, we're changing the focus from simply how many hours somebody's participating to long-term outcomes. So our CalOR team, um, we ran an RFP and we are now consulting with Pacific, no, Public Consulting Group. Um, and they are handling a lot of the data analysis for us. They handled the stakeholder review process, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, and our team locally at Social Services is uh, our director, Crystal Markitan, our new deputy here beside me, Rachel, who replaced Michelle Dibble. Um, and we have people on our team at every level of the organization so that we get input and buy-in from everyone. We are partnering with Yuba County for our peer review. Every county has to partner with another county. So um, we've already established a relationship with Yuba, so we bounce ideas frequently off of each other. So they will come here for our peer review, and then we will go to Yuba County for theirs. So the first thing of letting go of P WPR started several years ago with Mathematica, who was contracted with the state, to look at how we deliver services. Um, it used to be the focus was on getting a job, getting a job quickly. Now we've learned that it's better for somebody to be on aid for four or five years if they're getting a degree, something that will keep their family self-sufficient over time than to just put somebody in a job right now. We've learned a lot about brain science and how people think. Um, nobody likes to be told what to do. And so the minute you sit down with a client and say, okay, you are mandated to participate, nobody likes that. So it's reframing how we talk to people, making it goal-oriented. So we sit down with a client now and we ask them, what do you need help with right now? What are your goals? Let me help you set your goals. 
what is it that you need to be self-sufficient? So our clients um, are much more likely to buy into the program when they see that it's to their benefit. So CalOR is a five-year cycle, very similar to the cycle that um, CWS has, in that it is a continuous quality review process. So we start out by gathering all the data we can. We had stakeholder review forums, um, which we met with our partner agencies, we met with staff at every level, so that we can gather the information that we need to know how we're doing. Um, we submitted a self-assessment to the state in December, and in January, a system improvement plan is due to the state, and that the board will be required to sign off on, so this is why it was important today to... Excuse me, that's not an exit. You've got to go out the front. Thank you. So we wanted the board to be familiar with what the program is um, before January. I just want to pet all the dogs. <laughs> So right now, we are right smack in the middle of our five-year cycle, and our system improvement plan will be submitted to the state, and if they approve it, then we will go forward with um, setting our goals and strategies and tactics that we need to make changes to improve our program. So this is a basic conceptual framework um, of CalOR. The thing that's important on here is the red box down in the left-hand corner. There are a lot of outside influences that impact the data that we're receiving. For instance, the economic um, state of our county. What are the jobs that are available? Those really have an impact on the data we're gathering when we look at employment for people post CalWORKs. Um, when we look at CalOR, the data that we show will be long-term, and it will give us more information about how they're doing after they're off the program. And so that's really the important thing is, what, are we, what difference are we making for families? So continuous quality improvement is the county self-assessment, system improvement plan, and the peer review. So the peer review will be helpful because Yuba will come to our county and we will go through our policies and practices with them, um, share our suggested ideas for implementing change, and they can, will do the same with us. And it's having a second set of eyes giving us a different perspective. Before we uh, submitted our self-assessment to the state, we had a full week of forums um, we met with partner agencies, and all these forms were uh, facilitated by our contractor. And that gave us the ability to get uh, forthright opinions from our partner agencies and our clients without them talking to us. You never know if you're getting um, valid results when you are the one gathering your own data. So that was very helpful. Uh, we had 16 or 17 forums, um, gathered lots of information during the week. Um, some things were eye-opening and a lot of things we already were aware of. So we also involved our clients. So we did phone outreach to existing and past clients to get them involved in the program, offered a $50 incentive for participation just to share their views with us uh, to get the client perspective on how we're doing. So the de demographic data that we're collecting comes from several sources. Uh, a lot of it comes from our own system. And then we have EDD, which provides the long-term employment uh, wages people are receiving. We have an agreement through the Community College Chancellor's Office for education attainment rates and that sort of thing so that we ha get that from our partner agencies and what we have available locally. So it's not just social services data. So uh, the online dashboard for CalORS is public facing on the CDSS website and at the end of this presentation will be the links on how, if you want to ever go and look at it. There is county demographic data, there are reports from CalWORKs on our clients. Um, initial engagement has to do with welfare to work and how well we are bringing them into the program and getting them moving. Ongoing engagement, which are the activities they're participating in, how many hours, 
Uh, supportive services has to do with the things that we provide to our clients. If they're in education, we can pay for almost anything, their books, their parking, their childcare. Um, if they're in a nursing program and they need their scrubs, we can pay for all that, those sorts of things. Employment and wages comes from EDD. Exit and re-entries is interesting because it tells us a lot about how clients do after they're off the program. Are they taking a job? Is it successful? Are they promoting? Or are they coming right back on to aid? So this is a slide from the county demographics. This is poverty statistics. So the little green arrows point to Lake County. And this shows poverty and deep poverty rates. So 125% of the poverty rate are those clients who are doing fairly well. When you get to 50% of the poverty rate, you're talking families that are making half of what the federal poverty rate is. For a family of four, that's about $30,000 a year or less. So 50% of that would be a family of four making only $15,000 coming in. So it's very hard to, to live on that sort of income. Um, so there are a lot of county demographics on here which are eye-opening. This is looking at CalWORKs reports. This is average annual caseload by caseload type. So before Welfare to Work was implemented in 1996, there were approximately 500,000 families on cash aid in the state. After that, when welfare work became mandatory, that dropped off some. And then over time, we see fewer families on aid. So it's uh, much harder to determine the reasons for that. It could be that minimum wage is increased. Maybe they're making more money now. It could be that they timed out and they received all of the cash aid they're going to get. So there's a lot of different reasons why our caseloads have dropped. Initial engagement and appraisal timeliness. The top is California. The bottom is Lake County. Anywhere you see an asterisk, that means that there were fewer than 11, um, it, 11 families in the data. So it's de-identified. If it's 0%, that tells us here is an, an opportunity for improvement. <laughs> because initial engagement means getting them into their first activity within 90 days of their application. So a lot of this has to do with low staffing right now. Um, we're booking six to eight weeks out in order to get a client into welfare to work. Activity participation, this tells you a little bit about what people are doing when they're on CalWORKs. So they may be participating in behavior health, educational activities, which is, it's interesting to see from 20, what is it, 2015 through the year 2000, we have an increase. So we have more participating now than we had in the past. So I was very happy to see that. Um, employment, there's always been clients with jobs. They're on aid because those <laughs> jobs are either part-time or they don't pay enough to support a family. This performance measure has to do with employment. So the employment rate in blue is California, orange is Lake County. So looking at four years, um, and we're looking at back in time, the uh, information that comes from EDD is usually two to four quarters behind. So wage progression is interesting to see that we are very much aligned with California. Um, the first quarter is always going to be lower because somebody got a job in the middle of the quarter, so quarterly wages will hold them back. So those are always going to be lower where it says first quarter. Um, but in the second, two quarters after would be six months after they got off aid. Four quarters would be a year later. So um, we do see that people are increasing slightly over time, which is good. post works employment rate, we are looking at California compared to Lake County. And again, uh, we tend to mirror the state. There's no big anomalies here. Um, some of the data, when you're looking at 2020, has been impacted by COVID. Wage progression over time. Lake County and the state, you see the same sort of curve. But of course, Lake County wages are lower simply because uh, most of the jobs here pay less um, comparatively to other counties. So Cal or performance measures, there are 50 different measures that the state is looking at. 
from engagement to sanction rate, which has to do with um, people who don't participate in welfare to work, they become sanctioned. Orientation attendance rate, are they coming through our doors? Are they attending their activities? Are they in college and are they progressing? So this is just a simple visual to show where we are on performance measures. So client engagement, very similar to the state. Sanction rate, very similar to the state. You get down to the bottom. OCAT, appraisal timeliness. We are not within our state mandates. And we probably will not be until we're close to fully staffed. First activity participation. That's the same thing. We don't get people into their activity timely because we don't have enough staff. Right now our caseloads are about 150 cases per worker and they should be about 35 to 40. So this is phase two measures. These are measures that just were implemented so we don't have a lot of data yet to show on these. Um, so this will be really interesting over time. Child care access rate. How many of our clients are, are finding child care? Homeless assistance. Um, ancillary service access rate, transportation timeliness. Are we getting people what they need when they need it? <coughs> Family stabilization is a program that solves a crisis. If somebody has a crisis that they need to deal with in order to participate in welfare to work, that program can help them. So the impact of COVID is, Number one, CalOR was implemented right during COVID, so we don't have a good starting point. There's no baseline that is indicative of what a normal average year would be. So knowing that, um, 2020, 2021, 2022, those were the years that the state took off our state mandates. Our clients were allowed to receive cash aid without fear of sanction, and they could stay home during that entire time and do nothing. Um, that makes it much more difficult for us to engage people in the program because you become comfortable when you're allowed to stay at home. So it's been um, an uphill battle to get people out of their homes and participating again. But um, being able to have a relationship with a client and talk about where do you want to be in 10 years, what do you want for your family, really is the only way to get them to um, think long term. So what did we learn from staff? Um, the stakeholder forums taught us that our work environment is generally good. Um, being a smaller department means that we have stronger relationships, better communication, um, room for improvement when it comes to the supervisor and staff relationship. So that's something that um, we can probably address internally. Difficult to manage caseloads, that is high stress. And when workers are under stress, it's very difficult to be really creative in designing an employment plan for a client because you feel that time, uh, you just don't have the time to spend. So that really um, is making it hard to engage clients in the program. Staffing challenges, um, intimidating hiring processes and inability to compete with neighboring county wages. Telework has really made it difficult to attract staff and keep them. If you can live here and work in Sonoma County um, and make twice as much, why wouldn't you do that? So we've lost a fair amount of staff because of that. Um, ongoing training, difficulty of keeping up with the pace of rule and ch policy changes. Uh, that is just par for the course. Um, rules are always changing. It means um, you never get sedentary in your job. It's constant learning. What did we learn from clients? Um, all kinds of things. It was really interesting to see what they had to say. Um, Longer than expected wait times, that was something we were aware of. Frustration with resubmitting documentation. Um, some struggled with virtual and remote processes. We've tried our best to work with people and teach them, especially during the pandemic, how to access our services virtually. But it's difficult if you are a family um, with low income and your internet is not stable. It makes that twice as difficult. Um, so no wonder students struggled with education doing it remotely. So activities were varied. People participate in um, a lot of different activities and it is goal led. They can choose what they want to participate in. Um, some activities weren't accessible due to the location. 
We have a big lake right in the middle of our county, which means a lot of transportation. Universal themes. Um, transportation is an ongoing barrier. We do provide bus passes, um, but the buses don't always go to the places everybody wants them to go. Reliable child care providers. There are child care providers in the county that are reliable, but there's a perception, a mistrust that families have on aid if they've experienced trauma in their past. They're less likely to trust others with their children. So that is hard to get someone to participate in the program if they don't have trust in their child care provider. Lack of dependable and affordable internet access. Generational poverty. Um, that is something our county, it's become a way of life. If you grew up in poverty, it's very difficult to see your way forward out of that. Um, so we, we work with people, we keep talking to them about their future and their abilities because just because you grew up in poverty doesn't mean that that is going to be your whole life. So long-term understaffing, length of time between application, orientation, and first activity. People lose their motivation if they attend an, uh, their orientation for CalWORKs, and then five weeks go by before they hear from Wild Flutter Work. So we want to do something about that. Um, we discovered a lot of opportunities or things we can fix. Virtual service is a curse and a blessing. Um, it enabled us to provide services throughout the pandemic using Zoom. Um, we, able, we were able to put together uh, remote testing for learning disabilities. There were a lot of things that we learned during this pandemic and we had to embrace technology that we hadn't used in the past. So it was a learning experience for everyone. Reengaging participants post pandemic is difficult. So through the self-assessment process, some of the themes that we will most likely be focusing on in our self-improvement um, plan will be client engagement, our orientation attendance rates. There are some streamlining of processes that we can do. Um, we will work with Yuba County to see what we could do to shorten the time frame. Um, we've implemented group orientations, which helps some. That way, one worker can do the orientation for a group. Um, Tackling understaffing issues, we're doing what we can to attract people to our positions. We're doing presentations at the colleges before people graduate. Um, we let them know about merit and how to apply. Um, there's a lot of different things that we haven't considered yet that we could probably do to increase our achievement in our performance measures. Wage progression and reentry. This is going to be a more difficult thing to tackle, simply because we don't have control over someone after they're off the program. We don't have the ability to really know what's happening unless they are in our retention program where we're offering case management. Um, but one thing that we know we can do is really push education, because once you have a degree or certificate and you get into a job that um, pays better, you're much more likely to keep that job than if you are making minimum wage. So our next steps in the CalOR process. So we're looking at identifying our long and short-term goals for our system improvement plan. We'll select the performance measures to focus on and our team approach will brainstorm the strategies for consideration. We will put together a plan that will go to the state um, we will identify um, what potential roadblocks we may run into um, and create a timeline for implementation of the plan. We'll road test it, see how we do. It's a constant CQI process where we are constantly evaluating how did we do, what could we do better. Um, conducting the peer review and then we will go to Yuba for their peer review. Um, and then the board will sign off on the plan. So you will get to see it and comment and give us your advice and sign off on it. And that will be in January. So outcomes are what really matter. Um, WPR, while it's a federal measure, is something we are trying to let go of. We want to focus on long-term outcomes because that's really, that's why we're here, is to make changes. And CalWORKs and Welfare to Work really 
excites me because here is an opportunity for you to improve your life. So if we can get people on board or get our clients to realize what a difference it is if they participate, what a difference it can make for their families, that's really why we're here. So at the top is the web page link. You could go online and just type CDSS Calor and it will pop up. The data dashboard is online. Um, our county self-assessments will be posted shortly. The state is getting ready to post those. They said by the end of the month. So the dashboard has all of the data um, available on it. And my contact information is at the bottom if you have any questions. Anything I can answer. Well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, there's a lot there. And it looks like a um, lot of room for improvement, too, for us all. Um, I have a question about the type of work that is offered and what the employer, how does that work? Do you contract with other employers? Or what are some examples of the positions that people can get? You mean once they are clients, when, once they yes. go through the program? Yes. If you go through the program and um, the first thing we do is set goals with the client. What do you like? What are you interested in? What does that require? Do you, does it require education? If so, you know, we can put them in education. Um, once they get to the point where they are ready, we can put them in work experience or on the job training. We partner with uh, Mendocino Private Industry Council who runs our OJT program. So if somebody wants to work in a dentist office, but they have no experience. The OJT program gives you that experience because we can pay the wage for six months while you are learning on the job. Um, and from there, it's up to them to apply. We help work with them on how to write your resume. Um, we can buy your interview outfit. If you need your haircut, we can pay for that or tattoo removal. Um, so that you are job ready when you're through the program. Some people come into the program job ready. A great many others do not. And so if they're living through DV, sometimes they need to deal with that first. So we allow for that. And what's the overlap with um, CareerPoint? CareerPoint is very much aligned. They do what we do. The difference is that they can serve the entire population, whereas we are serving only CalWORKs low-income poverty families. So our clients can be their clients. Their clients are not necessarily our clients. Um, we partner with CareerPoint for a lot of things because they can support some industries that we cannot. If somebody wants to become a truck driver, um, the schooling for that is something that I can't pay for, um, but CareerPoint can. So we work with them, um, try to braid funding to serve clients in the best ways possible. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Crandall? Yeah, I'm looking at um, one of the slides where it says, CalWORKs annual average caseload by case type. Um, is it 200 and like maybe 300 total? Did you say that? 300 uh, total cases that we have in Lake County or? Right now I have 700, a little over 700 welfare to work cases. Okay. CalWORKs cases though are a little bit higher. I'm not quite sure what that number is because that includes people who are not necessarily welfare to work. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at the graph and I just can't tell the exact number. I was just wondering and what what um, what methods do you use to um, like determine? Do they have to come in or do you like refer when they have cases in other programs? We do a lot of referrals. We refer out to LFRC. Um, they run our CalLearn program which is for pregnant parenting teens. We refer to Behavioral Health who handles most of the behavioral um, health, mental health, SUDS issues if they have substance abuse. Um, yeah, Tribal TANF, we, um, we do work alongside Tribal TANF. The, the difference is a client cannot be both Tribal TANF and CalWORKs at the same time. So um, they can choose to go from one to the other. Um, not consistently, just once or twice and that's it. But um, we like to make sure that somebody's getting what they need, whether it's Tribal TANF or CalWORKs. Okay, thanks. Okay. Supervisor Green? Yeah, thank you for this. A um, lot to unpack, and we'll be doing that for a while, it sounds like, and we'll come back in January. Uh, I was just curious, just as a, as a subset, we have a much larger group of people receiving assistance that's not cash aid. Um, 
and I'm a little curious about that because uh, some way you said 700 right now so that seems to be an uptick from what I saw in the in the earlier data but what percentage would that 700 represent versus uh, the many thousands of people receiving uh, food assistance or medical or other type of uh, assistance medical is more is Far greater. I think it's probably five times as many clients on Medi-Cal. Do you know what the stats are? Almost 30,000 people on Medi-Cal. 30,000. 20, 29,000 or something. In like that. And with um, CalWORKs, it's time limited. You get 60 months and then um, that's it. So people come and go uh, much more frequently. If you're on Medi-Cal, it could be for years and years and years. The Same program, thing with CalFresh. The program requirements are significantly different between the two programs. So Medi-Cal is a large Rachel, can you bring the microphone? <laughs> sure. The program requirements between CalWORKs Cash Aid and Medi-Cal are significantly different. They're different programs. If you're on CalWORKs Cash Aid, you automatically get Medi-Cal, um, but Medi-Cal is a larger population. It has higher income limits. It has different ways to qualify. So we're always going to see a larger Medi-Cal population as opposed to just the individuals on CalWORKs or CalFresh because um, for CalWORKs, you've got to have minor dependent children to be eligible for the program, whereas CalFresh, you just have to have a need and um, for food and be within the income limits and property limits. You don't have to have any other linkage to CalFresh. Um, with Medi-Cal, it's even wider a group of people eligible. Yeah, so with CalWORKs, we're talking families, people with children in the home. Just, I'm just wondering, and I don't know what the average uh, monthly cash amount would be. I know it would vary by family size, but uh, I'm just wondering, again, this has been since the late 90s, is, is part of the disengagement just the, uh, you know, the, the constant calculation that people must make? Is the complexity of complying with this uh, worth the effort that I'm going to get for whatever X amount, $100, uh, this that is gets? part of it. Just the application is 23, 24 pages. Um, so uh, it is... Do you know what the I average... Uh, the average CalWORKs grant um, is about $960 a month. Now, it depends on your family size. If you're one person, it's going to be far less. If you have a family of 10, you're going to be making a, a great deal more. But it's still just keeping people above drowning. You know, it's not enough, really, in this society to live off of. So if you're on cash aid, hopefully it's for a short period of time, um, that's the cash aid portion. Your cow fresh that you get for food um, is a separate pot of money. Um, yeah, um, and it has to do with the size of your family and the amount of income coming in right. and deprivation as well. All right, last question, I promise. Uh, it, obviously, there's new metrics here engaging and then keeping people employed, but the reality of our workforce and the Yuba County's workforce and everyone's workforce, for that matter, is a much more fractured environment where ongoing employment opportunities may be slim uh, on a good day. So as valuable as these metrics may be, is there a punitive aspect to them? If we don't um, continue to keep people employed, you know, are, are there, uh, do we get reduced funding at the end of the day? Or, you know, are, are, is there a potential for us to get punished as a county for things that are beyond our control in terms of the outcomes that we not have to for, demonstrate? Not for Cal or For the federal WPR rate, if we don't meet um, Two parent, um, ninety percent, and no county basically is meeting that. There is a financial penalty, but through COVID, um, the state has been able to uh, refute those penalties, so we have not had to pay any penalties. I did calculate out what it would be for us. It's less than one percent of our CalWORKs budget. Okay, Supervisor Sabatier. I love this. Um, before we were talking about, uh, what was the word, penetration, looking at specific demographics and, and groups and breaking it down and seeing how many people of those groups are eligible and how many people we actually have on our programs. And just like you said, that means absolutely nothing other than we, we've touched them, but how did we affect them? How did we impact them? Uh, knowing that we've served 200 people does not tell me the quality of the service that they received or the life-changing impacts. Um, so I'm going to be patient. I, I just want to say that this is exciting. This is exactly what we need. Um, 
I want to make sure that our return on investment, because this is a very large investment that goes through social services uh, coming through the state, but it's our tax dollars that are feeding social services to provide these programs. We need to ensure that there's a return on that investment, and without that kind of data, it's really difficult to say what we're getting. Uh, unfortunately, we're saying words of generational uh, poverty, which tells me that we haven't had the impact necessarily that we've all wanted to have. Yes, uh, exactly. And understanding and knowing what that is so that we can pinpoint where the issues are and make those changes within specific programs rather than feel like we're doing the right things by changing things uh, is going to be so much better. So I'm just going to be patient for the process to conclude before it gets submitted over in January and it comes back to us. Um, but this is exciting because this is the exact kind of data that we need to really understand what specific program is doing a great, fantastic job and what program is not really uh, allowing people to really change their lives. We, we, we always want to help, but at one point we have to do the hard part of changing people's lives where they start helping themselves. Uh, if we continuously help, then 20 years down the road, we will be right here continuing to help. Yeah. Uh, we have to do something better than just help. We have to make that change. So I'm excited. I'll be patient and uh, looking forward to uh, how this moves forward through the process. Vice Chair Simon. Yeah, yeah I think great program as we're moving forward. But I just going to make a comment. You made a comment of opportunities where uh, they could be paid to work for six months, good opportunities there. In redoing the program and rethinking this, we have, we have a problem. We have a problem getting Department of Social Services workers mm -hmm. and get them, you know, getting them in, getting them trapped. Can that be a part of this program where, when we're talking about generational change, maybe you're the first person in, in the family it gets a county job for social services and went through this program to do that. Could we use it as a, a pipeline, you know, in, in this process as internship or opportunities? Everyone on this program may have an opportunity. They just haven't been given mm -hmm. having the skills to work in our social services department. What would be better than that to bring, get someone hired, come through the program and say, look, I was in your position three years ago. I went through the program or five years ago gone through the program, now I'm working on social services. Are we, are we already doing that as setting up a pipeline uh, to invite out of the 700 to work for social services we, programs? We did so. originally have an OJT program that, that we had positions for, but when the OJT state program switched to become um, expanded subsidized employment, merit, there was an issue with merit because you have to pass the test to be employed. So we can't just put people in an OJT position and if they're successful, keep them without having that pass that test. And at that point, if they pass the test and we hire them, then there's no need for the OJT program. So we're looking at reinventing um, the past OJT program that we had and keeping our ESE program as well that places in private sector businesses. So I, I think there's some opportunity there as well because um, it's hard to attract someone to our positions if they don't, you have to have a degree or you have to have the education and experience, a, a combination, or come up through the ranks. Um, so we've worked with the colleges, um, with Woodland um, in particular, to make sure that they're offering the courses that meet our um, minimum qualifications. So over time, I think that will make a difference um, and letting people know that this is a great field to work in, um, and it really is. So it just yeah, trying to, to bridge that gap there, and you know, coming, coming, coming from a standpoint, uh, you made a couple of comments there that not everyone needs that degree. I know there are state requirements, but that education part, some people just are, are great at street, learning on the street, going through mm -hmm. life, understanding things, and then become a great employee and given the opportunity to learn from that. I, I just hope we can, it's great that it was there, but we have, we have a problem with the county. We need Department of Social Services workers. We have a lot of folks in, in the CalOR program that need to go through that education process, do that stuff, and I don't know if we could just strengthen that pipeline to, to create our own workforce. And like I said, generational you know, poverty uh, coming from a, a tribal community, un uh, understanding that is a real challenge. And sometimes education is the one barrier uh, when you have a great workforce, great opportunity, 
a, a good worker, but just doesn't have that educational piece, that that, that can be used as a barrier too mm -hmm. to keep that generational poverty. So education just always can't be the answer because it isn't the answer for everybody. And yeah, you know, I would. Uh, I don't know how we fix it. I'm not saying it's easy to fix, but. It, it, it does, and we all know that. We have family members that are just excellent at what they do, never went to school or that wasn't their mm. thing, but they're, they're really good, and they're, in, they're doing great things for the community. So just to rethink the program as we're going through there, I see we have a problem on the county side of bringing our Department of Social Services and, and employment staff up, and we have this big base of 700 people that are going through the program. There's got to be 50 or 75 that would really fit into the unique opportunity to yeah. get educated and get a job. So, And even without education, you can come in as an OA, work your way up um, yep. through eligibility and then to employment and training worker positions. Um, so, and then creating pride in the household. Yeah, I would love to see it. Mom or dad or, you know, got a job at social services and they're helping my aunt and uncle. and You know, so um, it's compounding from that point. I think it's unique. We'll wait and see, but I just... Thought it would be a great time to say it right now. I would love to see an Building intern that. program as well. Yeah. Um, if we could put something together for that, I think that would be a, a great way to get people in the door as well. Um, and especially with that little bit, oh, they get an, uh, you know, a, a, an extra grade or whatever you want to call it, a, a step up because they're in the Calor program. They're saying, hey, this person really might fit into that that role. They're, yeah. they're, they're putting the work in. So let's give them a, a little carrot here to, to keep going. So, all right. Thank you. Yep. Supervisor Green. Just one last question. Nope. Despite the difficulties and all that, um, just like uh, with Medi-Cal right now, we just came out of COVID, so we're recertifying a lot of people, and there's definitely a public outreach uh, campaign supporting that. Uh, coming out of COVID and now with these new metrics, what, what current outreach is there? And if this is a unsung program that not to put any more stress on the workers you don't have to process the cases, but you know what can we do to actually uh, uh, re-educate people about the existence of the program, and if if they are in a situation, you know uh, where they could actually benefit from that. What type of public outreach does the state do as a routine basis, and what do we do here locally? That is a good question. Um, we. Uh, the, CalFresh has had outreach going in the past, but we have not done that with CalWorks, but we can use our funding in that capacity. So that might be something to look at. Um, but you know, without the staff right now, you know, I'm a little leery of doing that, but I'm sure there are families out there who are not on cash aid. I remember when I was in poverty and I had two children and um, I didn't even know about the program. I and mean, that was in the 90s. And so, you know, it would have been a huge help had I known. Um, Hopefully things are different these days and people are aware of the programs. Um, I think with online availability, you can pretty much connect with anything if you have a, a phone. Um, so one thing we will look at is the county demographics compared to our CalWORKs population to see are there segments of the population we're missing. Um, if Spanish speakers, if 5% of the county speaks Spanish but only 1% of our clientele does, then we know there's a gap. So you know, we look at those things as well. Supervisor Sabatier. Um, just a couple of things. I had a conversation with CAO Parker yesterday, um, just thinking of something that you were bringing up here, Supervisor Simon. In-house training versus waiting for somebody to have a piece of paper to say that I can do this. Um, we, we have the possibility of looking at those types of options because if we train them exactly for what the needs are, then they'll have the knowledge and experience to do the job. Uh, and maybe there's a way that we can do that, and maybe we need to look at every possible option on how to get there, because uh, I agree. Let, let's make sure we get our people accessing the jobs that are available that we're providing. Um, you mentioned Woodland. Uh, you didn't mention Mendocino. I hope that there's the same level of um, collaboration happening with Mendocino. I know that there's a, a good collaboration with Woodland, but Woodland I'll just be blunt, I just met with the uh, chancellor yesterday. Uh, Woodland has its hurdles that it's going through, especially right now. 
Um, they just got rid of their LEARN program, which is like the remedial classes to help you uh, get ready to obtain your high set, which is kind of like the GED. So sorry to hear that. And I'm, I'm unhappy that nobody was aware that that was going to happen because there was just a unilateral decision from Woodland to get rid of it rather than a conversation with local community leaders saying, yeah, what can you do to uh, fill in this new void that's going to happen? And so I know I did make a request yesterday that we we need to create a community committee of educational leaders, social services, all of those that are impacted by the work that the college does so that we, we can talk about what changes are going to happen so that if it's positive changes, how do we work together to make sure to uh, get it out to everybody and, and maximize the results. If it's things that are going to change that might have negative consequences, how do we work together to change what we're doing to make sure that there's still something available to the people here. Uh, so I just want to, uh, I know you have been working, I've seen you when I worked over at the college that you've been working with the college for quite some time. Um, but I think it's important more than ever to make sure that we have a louder voice on them knowing what our needs are uh, yeah. rather than dealing with the consequences of their actions, which is happening at Yuba and not happening here. Yeah, they've had quite a change in the administrative positions going on. Um, our CalWORKs counselor there promoted and then went elsewhere. And so um, they have a, a CalWORKs counselor, but is working out of Woodland. So, you know, we don't have a local person right now to collaborate with. Um, we went through the same thing with Mendocino a couple of years ago. They had a new dean come in and, um, you know, you have to build relationships from square one when that happens, but we're willing to do that. We do have clients taking classes at Mendocino and at um, Sonoma and some online um, with various different colleges. But it's those relationships that really make the program work. So, Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to open it up for the public. Is there anyone here that would like to give comment? Just say your name and you'll have three minutes. Hello again, Zachary Ray. Um, over the last 17 years, I've been working for Tribal TANF. I was a Tribal TANF uh, recipient as a 20-year-old father. Um, and so uh, over the more re most recently, um, I was the executive director for California Tribal TANF Partnership for the last four years here. Um, and the concerns that I have are that um, that in your presentation, the tribes weren't contacted. They're not included in your demographics. They're not your partners. Um, the tribal TANF programs that you have two of here in the county weren't contacted. Um, it, they're not who you're peer reviewing with, which is a major concern. You have two other social services programs here um, that, you're, that you're not working with. And in those four years that I was the executive director, we had no contact with the county. There was no partnership. There was no work, working together as you um, falsely claimed to the, to the Board of Supervisors. Um, especially with WIOA funds, uh, tribal TANFs are, are mandated state mandated partners, um, and there's no partnership that's taking place there. Um, and so that I just wanted to bring that up. Um, it, it is a big concern that there there's no peer review happening between the programs that are here. Um, CTTP is is one of the oldest programs in the nation. Um, it celebrated its 20th year anniversary here this summer, um, and you also have Scotts Valley Tribal TANF, um, both off of uh, Parallel Road. Uh, uh, more recently, we've been hearing in the community that there's a lot of uh, concern with how the participants are being treated, um, especially our native community. Um, there's very uh, blatantly racist policies that you are enforcing. Um, I had a call with your director last week about this, and I'm supposed to be meeting with your deputy director here pretty soon, um, where our, our people are being turned away, they're being... Um, treated very poorly. Um, and again, there's they're very blatantly racist uh, policies that are on the books that have been on the books for a long time. Um, there's a fundamental lack of understanding and cultural competency across the board in all of your departments within the social services. Um, and you say, what differences are we making for families? What families are you talking about if you're only focusing on one segment of the population and, and all these other families are being left out? And so that would be my concern. Um, and as your presentation shows, there's it, it's a, a sole focus on a small portion of the population. While your consultants, highly paid, didn't go into the native communities and engage with them at all. And so I do want to bring all of those issues up and have the board be, understand that um, the county can do better and they should be doing better. Whereas the 76 programs in this nation that are tribal TANF have always met their work participation rates, 
and we are the only ones that are subject to fines, whereas the states and most counties have never met the work participant rates, and they are not subject to the same fines, even though the federal regulations say that they're supposed to be. And so um, you have successful programs here in the county that I suggest you start working with. Thank you. Um, just to um, l let you know, um, you may not be aware, we do have um, an MOU with CTTP that was signed uh, recently, within the past two or three months. Um, and that hadn't been updated in quite a long time. We do what, what we can to work with Tribal TANF, but it is a separate program from ours. Um, and we're awaiting signature on an MOU with uh, Scotts Valley Band of Pomo Indians as well. So um, once those are in place, that will open the door for better communication. Can I, can I respond to that? The, the county, Just the come. Come up to the microphone and I'm gonna give you another three minutes. The counties do have a responsibility to have MOUs because they have to have the verification on aid. They have to have the time on aid verification. But very rarely do those MOUs include anything other than VOA information. And so there's no operating agreement where there's, there's partnership taking place. Those are just time on aid and verifications, uh, income verifications. And uh, most of our participants, although that is, like you said, a duplication of aid to have Tribal TANF and CalWORKS, um, all of our participants are usually eligible for uh, SNAP, your CalFresh, and your Medi-Cal benefits. And so we do have partners, uh, participants in common, um, and there should be participation that's happening above and beyond the MOU process of just VOAs. And I'd love to hear more about, you had mentioned that um, people are being turned away. I would love to hear more about that if you wanted to contact me, um, call me sometime and just let me know more about what you're seeing. Yeah, I, I spoke with Crystal last week. We're supposed to be meeting, I think, with the deputy director. I'd love to have you included and we could talk about that. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, do we have anyone else with public comment? Check the Zoom room. I'm not seeing any hands up in Zoom. Okay, all right. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Doretta Merrill, and I was at the warming center in Lakeport. I started being there in May. Sorry, ma'am, would you like? In May. There we go. And the director at the time was, <coughs> was Yvonne, and the director now used to be the cook. She would cry because we had to have chicken. Well, now we get chicken five, seven days okay, a week. So this item is not about the warming center? It's it a, is about the warming center. No, no, this item that we're oh, I'm discussing sorry. right now okay. is not the warming center item. We'll get to that a little later. Okay, is there, do we have public comment on this item from anyone else in the chambers? All right, I'll bring it back to the board then for any final comments or thoughts. Any? Okay. Well, this was a presentation. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all the information um, that was brought here today. And um, it sounds like there's going to be some conversations um, to continue the work forward for everyone. Our, our next item is at 1030, so we will take a break until then um, and come back. Ready for 6.5, 10.30 a.m., consideration of a resolution amending the master fee schedule for departmental services rendered by the county. This is by admin, and we have our deputy director, Moreno. Deputy County Administrative Officer, yes, Casey oh, Moreno. Sorry. Um, so I have um, a few different departments that have requested that their um, fees be changed. I also have a fee study done for environmental health um, to present to you today. So I have a PowerPoint. <laughs> this or? Oh, the, okay. Is it shared on Zoom? It doesn't look like it is. It's not shared. Okay, so the first department is behavioral health. Um, they are requesting that three of their fees be um, re reduced down to um, their 
original rate um, that they were prior to the last change that went into effect on July 1st. Uh, the reason that it increased so significantly was due to the uh, state mandate on medical payers, and so they have decided that they don't want to um, charge private payers that same rate, so they are reducing them back down to their um, pre-rate. The next one is code enforcement. They are requesting to add um, fees to be in line with the rest of community development, which is advertising, postage, copies. Next is library. So they are requesting one of their fees be amended to say missing or damaged cases or charges for library devices. The fee is gonna stay the same uh, $10. Um, so we're just changing the description. Right. So into the environmental health fee study, uh, there was a few variables that were uh, noticed during the fee study. So the current data management system has significant deficiencies, which lead to staff um, taking a lot longer to enter time um, into the system. They are resolving that with their current RFP, um, which closed, they have selected a vendor. Um, it's RFP number 2327. So they are in contract negotiations at this time. The next is staff are double coding to projects. So there are instances where there are two staff members that are required to go out for safety reasons. And so they are both coding time to that same project code. That has been resolved um, effective immediately. A few months ago, they added a new activity code so that they are able to split out their time and in future uh, fee studies, it will only be um, accounted for once. And then time spent on similar projects varies widely. Um, some projects will take you know, a small amount of time. Other projects will take a lot longer. Travel time is a um, huge factor in that. Um, so that was a huge variable in the fee study. Uh, their goal is to implement their new data management system. And that should be starting in the next few months and then um, to reassess the fees in the next three to five years with a new fee study on their new data management system. From the fee study, um, in conjunction with county admin, it has been um, recalculated. Their hourly rate should be reduced to $103 an hour, not the current $135. Um, historically, environmental health has been increasing it by the CPI, and uh, so a fee study was just completed, and it should actually be at $103 an hour. Uh, just as a comparison to surrounding counties, Mendocino's at $150, Sonoma's at $218, Yolo's at $176. Yuba is one sixty seven ninety nine and Glen County is ninety two oh seven. So there was quite a few land fees that had some pretty significant changes. So the first column is the fee prior to the fee study being completed, so prior to July first effective date. And then the last approved fee study, or I'm sorry, uh, master fee schedule update, which was effective on July 1st of 2023. Next to it is the fee study results and then the recommendation um, for today's uh, master fee schedule update. So just to highlight a few of them, the septic abandonment was prior at $137. What was approved was $144. However, the fee study results were $674. So they are recommending the $175 be removed or be approved. I'm sorry. Uh, next one is to highlight the new permit cap and fill. It was previously at $748. What was approved was $1,751. The fee study results was $3,009. And so they are requesting it be approved at $975. I have a question on yes. that. Um, the fee study results is the actual cost or the median or mean cost of doing that service? Correct. Yeah, it's the uh, time spent in over the past five years, not including 22, 23, but the five years prior to that. Uh, time spent compared to the time that was uh, charged. And so I'm, I, I'm not against making things more accessible to people. However, I just have to question if we're going to... Um, 
for example, the site evaluation. We approved it at six hundred. The fee study says it's nine hundred thirty-five dollars, but we're going to reduce it to five fifty, even though the study shows that it costs us nine hundred and thirty-five dollars. At what point is that a gift of public funds, knowing that it costs us that much, and us even reducing the cost? Just kind of curious where that line. What, 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 when are we straddling the line and when have we completely gone off the line? And that's part of the um, variables that I mentioned previously was the, um, the time spent was not always accounted correctly in the system. So it takes, like to write a receipt, it should only take five minutes to enter everything. It's taking half an hour. So, and that's just basic data entry from the front counter. Um, so when the inspectors are going in, they're not able to currently um, go out to the um, site and write their notes. They have to come back to the office and do that. So their time spent is um, taking a lot longer than it should. And then if there are two people going out for safety reasons, they're both coding to it. So what really took an hour, it's coded as two hours. So there's that, um, and so that's why they want to come back with a fee study in three to five years and hopefully get closer to being in line with what it's actually costing. But if two people were out there, don't we have to bill for both of their time, even though it took one hour? I asked um, Craig about that and um, the environmental health director, and he said it depends on what the reason is. If it's safety, because anybody going to Pillsbury, they send somebody out there with them because cell reception. Um, so that, they don't feel like they should charge the applicant for that because of their location. Um, if it's safety reason, like somebody is being difficult, um, I feel like that should be charged, but we have to be fair to everybody. So um, just for the public's understanding, these are self-funded departments. So Correct. we have to make sure that we're appropriately charging but also not operating at a loss. And so that's why I asked the we're question. pretty, yeah. So we're very confident that these recommended fees will, won't be operating at a loss and we won't have to supplement with general fund. General fund does not get pulled over um, for uh, environmental health. They do pull from realignment from public health. Okay. Just one other question. <clears throat> I believe that the law is increases need to be uh, identified through a fee study of sorts. We increased it to, let's just use the um, new permit standard from 642 to 982, and now we're recommending to bring it down to 900 based on the fee study. Did we have a fee study to bring it to 982? So why is it three months later a new study has identified it as less. I'm just kind of curious if there's, what do we do about all the permits in between 7-1 and now? Because it would seem to me that we either didn't do an in-depth fee study or we did a very bare bones. I, I, it just, it, it, it's weird to do two studies, one that says increase and then three months later having one that says, by the way, decrease it. It, it makes me ask questions as to how did we ever say increase? So there was only one fee study that was completed. Um, and so the original fee study that was submitted um, and those numbers that were taken off of there, environmental health felt like people would not pay those prices. And because of those variables that they are working on um, resolving, they didn't want to increase them so high that people wouldn't pull permits. And that's their main concern is if they're too high, people won't pull them and then they'll still do it. And then we lose out even more. I, Go ahead. I also just hearing this discussion makes me think of some of the uh, folks that I've spoke with about their permits and um, their concerns are like a like one of the situations um, in their permits. There's a um, there's room or topics that they need to pay a permit uh, amount because of the potential road, um, you know, the road road impact. Yeah, the road impact. I know in, in the specific areas that I'm talking about, the roads probably haven't been done for years. So they're like, why, why are we adding this to the permit for, for this when, when it hasn't been done? So I mean, in some instances, I see the recommended for these type of situations, but I do hear you when it comes to 
um, you know, self-funded departments and needing to, you know, not only be made whole, but also have some sort of, um, you know, increase that helps with, you know, some of their budgets. So, I don't know. I just wanted to say that because I'm hearing you say a little lower recommended and in a sense that makes sense to me because of what I just described about those impacts and maybe some other things too, but yeah. So here's a graph uh, showing the um, the same fees that we were just looking at the data for, and the purple bar is the fee study, which is significantly higher. Uh, and so hopefully with the next fee study, they'll be a lot closer in line, um, and those uh, variables will be addressed. And is that going to be next year or how? Three to five years. Three to five years? Uh, yes. And the reason for that is the new data management system is going to take them some time to get used to and get training on and get everything uploaded on there. Uh, so they want to use new data and not use part from the old data management system and part from the new. Okay. Thank you. Next is the well fees. So there was just two of them that they are looking at reducing um, down to $135. Previous was 108 for each of those fees. And then the fee study came back quite a bit higher. So next one is food fees. So these were the only fees out of all of the food that they looked at that had a pretty significant um, change. So to highlight the restaurant bar under 650, that was $745 originally, increased to $1,403. Fee study came back at $1,871, and they are now recommending $850 be approved. The vehicle mobile food facility, that one was originally $151, increased to $281. Fee study came back at $375 and they are recommending 200. And then the coffee house kiosk low risk prepackaged food, that was originally at $204, increased to $633. Fee study came back at $844, and they are recommending 400. Um, also to note, um, the fee study, or I'm sorry, the approved master fee schedule that was approved effective July 1st. They have not been collecting those high rates. They have been collecting on the original so that they, now that they're decreasing most of their fees um, down, there's not a need for a refund or anything like that. And then a graph showing the fees for food and the purple again is the fee study results. And then there's a few fees that were highly variable and they are requesting that they be changed to the hourly rate. Um, just a few to note on there is the mobile food facility plan check remodel and alteration. That one was previously $307. The, what was approved was 481. Fee study came back at 641. So they are requesting that be changed to an hourly rate. Um, consultation pre-application fee. That one was originally the hourly rate at 135. However, the fee study did find on average over the past five years, it was $899. So because of that huge difference, they're requesting that be changed to hourly so that depending on what the consultation or pre-application is, they can charge appropriately. And that is the end of my presentation. Okay. Supervisor Sabatier. <coughs> so uh, a part of me has some concerns. Uh, everything looks good as far as what's recommended, but the process, I'm slightly confused. Um, we're talking about a fee study. There will be another one done in three to five years, but I fully anticipate that there will be changes in the next iteration of years as we go through the fee schedule. And from my understanding, you can't change the fee schedule without a fee study attached to it. So are there miniature fee studies that come along with it? Is it just based on salaries and that whatever 2%, 3% increase might be that that's what happens for the fee schedule? I, I just, I think that I'm gonna ask 
and it doesn't have to be given to everybody, but I'm going to ask next time there's a fee schedule. I want to see all this, the fee studies as to why we're seeing the increase because it's supposed to be there, but it's not shared with the public. It's not shared with us. Uh, here you're sharing some of the, the final data, but it makes no sense that we just increased it, whether that was May or June, and that now we're doing, based on a fee study, an, another iteration of it. So to me, why wasn't that done in May? or no changes in May and changes today with the fee study, I'm very confused. It feels like multiple fee studies are occurring or one of them's not occurring and we're approving increases that maybe we're not getting the right type of reporting. I, from this perspective, I have concerns that I'm not understanding how it is that we got to the point that today we're reducing things. Um, so I just, want to make that request that I will be asking for all the fee studies from now on just because it's not been made easily available uh, to both the um, I know it should be available if I ask for it, but I just, this feels awkward uh, in the way that we've done this. Appreciate that things are being reduced. I hope that we can make sure that our uh, departments stay whole. That's important to me. Uh, because we shouldn't be gifting uh, public funds to individuals that are trying to do projects or start businesses. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like I'm less understanding of this process today than I was before. So, Supervisor Green. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I appreciate the questions. Um, uh, as I recall, my questions had to do with the original adoption of this fee schedule, and uh, and at that time I was expressing discomfort with the fees that were uh, enacted that were pegged to that previous fee study. Uh, and my discomfort at the time led to me voting no on the fee schedule, no offense to the rest of the departments and their very lovely fees. I'm very appreciative that environmental health and Mr. Weatherby in particular uh, took took my comments to heart and maybe some of his own internal uh, uh, thoughts on where we landed with the fee schedule when it was enacted uh, based on the prior fee study. I do want to point out uh, on the attachment that changes are highlighted in yellow. Yes, there are lots of reductions. There are several increases as well. Uh, and I think it, overall it is a, a thoughtful approach to taking a look at all the fees that environmental health is changing, uh, charging across a wide variety of activities, land permits, food permits, and, and in particular, I want to highlight um, the changes to our, our cottage industries, our, our cottage uh, food licenses, our coffee houses, our micro enterprise home kitchen operations, uh, which is a new type of uh, permit that we do to support uh, people that can't stand up a full service restaurant. So we want to encourage uh, those people that are uh, doing entry-level work in the food service as they potentially uh, grow up into a full service op operation. So I, I, I acknowledge the questions with the fee study. I'm, I'm encouraged to hear there will be a new data system that will help uh, EH moving forward and really accurately charging its actual costs. And I, I hope that that data management system will inform the next fee study uh, so that everyone will have a, a real comfort level when, when that comes back. Um, but I, I just want to highlight that although there are some substantial price reductions in here that could potentially raise questions of adequate cost recovery, I'm, I'm just strongly supportive of it because I think the vision is there. We do need to charge adequate fees to make the county whole, but we also have to be very conscious of the impacts these fees can have on people trying to set up and run and maintain businesses. And uh, so I'm, I'll be supporting this. Okay. I'll open it up for public comment. Do we have anyone in the chambers who wishes to give comment on this item or in the chambers or I'm sorry, in the Zoom room? Not seeing anyone in Zoom? Okay. I'll bring it back to the board for action. Madam Chair, if I, if, oh, if I may. Thank you. Yes. Um, just uh, as a point of uh, clarification. Um, uh, understand that there were several revised attachments that were um, provided in the uh, uh, agenda packet for this item. And I believe staff is, for clarification, looking to uh, have the document labeled as 23, oh, labeled as revised 10 23 23 MFS update 10.24.23 changes only as the uh, Exhibit A referenced in the uh, resolution. 
that's before your board today. And in that resolution, as revised, uh, the on page one, um, section two, uh, the phrase highlighted in yellow um, uh, should be uh, deleted then um, as part of the amended resolution that's before your board. I don't see it highlighted. Uh, in the packet. Are you looking at the revised resolution amending master fee schedule 1024? Yes. It's uh, labeled revised 10-23-23 AA resolution amending master fee schedule 10.24. So to this, that says the fees and charges highlighted in yellow in the attached exhibit A would be deleted? Um, just the phrase highlighted in yellow. Okay. Oh, I was looking for something that was highlighted in yellow. <laughs> I apologize. Do we need to specify which one is the exhibit A that we're finalizing since there's so many revised? Right. And if your board wishes, uh, as I stated, the uh, st staff is recommending um, the document labeled as revised 10 23 23 MFS update 10.24.23 changes only as the exhibit A for that resolution because that does not contain any highlights. I, I just wanted to make sure that, that I understood the logic and that we didn't need the full um, exhibit of fees. It's only the ones that we are changing that we are approving in the amendment. Okay. I offer the resolution, the appropriate resolution as stated by county council. And as amended. And as amended. Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Sabatier? Aye. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor Green? Aye. And Supervisor Paiska? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. So we have some time. Are we should we take a closed session item? Or eight point two? Uh how about eight point three? Eight point three? Okay, so we are going, we have time in between our next item, which is scheduled for 1130. So we're going to clear the chambers and move into closed session. And we are going to 8.3, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1, Earthways Foundation, Inc., V County of Lake et al. So if everyone could just... Briefly clear out the chambers and we'll invite you back in uh, for our 1130 item. We are back for 6.6, .6, our 1130 a.m. item, consideration of agreement between the County of Lake. I'm sorry, one moment. Was there any action taken out of closed session? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was no action to be taken out of closed session. For item 8.3. For item 8.3, there was no action to be taken. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move on to our 11.30 a.m. item, consideration of agreement between the County of Lake Behavioral Health Services as the lead administrative entity for the Lake County Continuum of Care and Blue Horizons Foundation in the amount of $400,000 for fiscal year 2023-24 and behavioral health services and public services. Well, we have our director Jones here. Thank you um, for that. <clears throat> and a point of clarification, there is an error in the title of the item and uh, the title is correctly reflected on the memo. Um, so I am hoping that uh, CAO Parker, we may display the correct title on the screen. Supervisor Spatier. And if I may as well, uh, just to kind of clarify the separation of sponsorship, um, the juvenile hall is owned by the County of Lake, has been reviewed by public services uh, for any updates, and part of the conversation is to uh, kind of discuss the building itself. Uh, so the public services is um, for that specific topic. Behavioral health services is for the um, uh, process of moving forward or considering this contract. Just wanted to make that statement. Thank you, Supervisor. 
Okay. So, um, obviously, this is a three-parter, and the first part is a discussion, as Supervisor Spatier stated, regarding the continued... Yes, I am. Is that the correct? It is. Correct. Yes, that's the correct. A, yes. B, and C. Yes, A, B, and C, correct. Okay. And, and so there you see... Oh, hi, Matthew. I think so. And just for further clarification, the A, B, and C was on the memo since uh, the posting of the agenda. Uh, for some reason, the title did not completely uh, get placed on the agenda header. It was um, human error. It was my human error. With <laughs> so, um, Lars, do you want to come up? Also, to Great the timing. stage, we're welcoming Director Ewing from Public Services. Thank you so much. And so, yes, to clarify, Director Ewing is here representing item A, which is the consideration of the juvenile hall as a county-owned building. And uh, Doc Director Ewing's department are stewards of county-owned facilities. And so it appeared pertinent to have some discussion about the continued use of this building as there are some concerns. All right. Um, would you like to? Sure. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good morning. So I, I think that maybe the best way to, to initiate this is it did, did come to the Space Committee last week. Space Committee uh, discussed this. Um, historically, that building, well, it's a correctional facility. Let's, let's you know, be honest. Uh, it, it, and it has sat uh, dormant for a, a period of years, uh, has not been in operation, which causes a lot of problems on the building systems. Uh, imagine your car being parked uh, for, for five years and then going back out and let's, let's go drive it. So, uh, so the Space Committee uh, expressed some concerns with uh, not so much the you know, the, the, the current or immediate use of it, it's, it's the long-term use of it. So is, is there something that we can, what can we do to uh, uh, improve the building or is it the right building for that long-term? Uh, if it is determined from the, the board's direction to, to, to use this as a shelter, um, I did put some rough, uh, very rough uh, cost estimates on, on some of the identified repairs um, uh, along with what were the operational costs of that building for facility uh, facility use when it was in use as juvenile hall? Um, just so we have a, a basis of understanding. So, uh, so roughly uh, from 2010 to 2015, facility costs were in the range of about about 90,000 a year. Um, uh, just just to keep it in operation, uh, the, the repairs that uh, that I looked at, um, along with my staff, uh, we're looking at about 150 to 200,000 to to take care of the repairs. That's that's conservative. Uh, we're going to try to do as much of it uh, in-house as we can, but, uh, but I want to be realistic. So um, the recommendation was, uh, was to continue. If it's the board, board's direction to move ahead, then, then absolutely we can support that. Supervisor Sabatier. So I, I did appreciate that we got a, a list uh, from our building official as well as others of concerns and things that we needed to take a look at. Um, my hopes and desires, I don't want to make a promise here today, but I feel that the continuum of care is making a lot of requests of the county and appreciates the county's partnership in having a shelter open and available uh, for those that are experiencing homelessness. And I know that we do receive funding specifically to maintenance and upkeep of shelters. Uh, that was actually written in our grant proposal that we submitted to the state. I don't know what the exact numbers look like, but I do want to take a look at that from the COC perspective so that we are not using general funds funds or the county is not having to flip this bill, uh, both for the maintenance that needs to occur sooner than later, as well as the continued maintenance and use of the facility. So that's something that I want to bring back to the COC to be able to discuss, take a look at our finances, and then bring back to the board and let you know uh, what our hopes and desires are as far as using those funds and what's available. Okay. Any uh, vice chair Simon? No. Just want to make a comment. Um, you know, Lars, you said something very important is uh, the shelter conversation that's been going on. Uh, definitely, there needs to be a shelter in Lake County. Whether or not this building is the building for that long-term vision, I think we, we really need to, to look into that. When we first started about uh, the use of the building, I know that we had talked about hopefully finding an agency that we could partner with and potentially sell the building, get it out of county control, but partner with the agency that's going to be running if this is going to be the spot for it. So I just, I, I do want to make comment to that because I know in the beginning discussions, um, 
you know, about the juvenile hall building and, and its use. Um, some of those discussions were there uh, to look at a long-term opportunity. And if that is the building for it, to get some out of county control uh, with an agency, maybe a potential sale, and then support from outside in instead of uh, doing it the way we're doing it right now. So I just I want to make that statement whether or not that happens, but we need to have those discussions down the road as we're moving forward with it. Yep. Shelter in Lake County is needed. That's not the conversation. Where it is needed is the conversation that needs to happen down the road. Just and want to make that comment. If I could just comment on, on the, the history of the building, obviously correctional facility, uh, juvenile hall, and, and then uh, 2015 vacated, uh, or juvenile hall operations moves elsewhere. Probation was there for a period of time using it as their, uh, as their day reporting center, um, using it as an office, not, not, you know, not using the, um, uh, the, the actual juvenile hall portion of it really. Uh, and so a, a few, few years um, uh, dormant. Uh, and, and then 2019, uh, 2020, uh, a COVID isolation center. Um, and then it, it, has, it has kind of um, uh, morphed from there, um, but there, there hasn't been any um, you know, architectural space programming done for use as a shelter. We're, we're, we, have, we have the shell there, so we're, we're using it. Um, but you know, if, if that is identified as a long-term solution, then, um, then I would suggest some, some space programming, some, some architectural space pro programming being done, which does not come uh, 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 free. Um, uh, and, and then ultimately the uh, renovations or adaptive reuse of the facility would, uh, would also come, come at, a, at a cost. So any, any repairs that I'm talking about here are, are essentially existing facility repairs. It's, it's not turning it uh, from a, a juvenile hall into a, uh, into a shelter per se. We're, we're making use of that facility. So I just I want to make sure that, that we're clear or that I'm clear on, on what those costs would, uh, would truly get us. Thank you. And just one further point about uh, finances. So for the Lake County Continuum of Care, we are in the process of uh, doing a reconciliation and determining exactly all of our admin fund amounts and, and also maintenance and other indirect costs that we may bill up for our various grants. And we should have that um, determined within the next month. That will be presented to the Lake County Continuum of Care uh, as a package moving forward, your board will, uh, will be seeing a resolution that will authorize uh, Behavioral Health Services to serve as the lead administrative entity and an MOU between the COC and Lake County Behavioral Health Services. So that will finally button everything up, I think, pretty neatly, um, and we'll have a better understanding of uh, uh, the COC's financial standing. Supervisor Sabatia. And just to respond to Supervisor Simon, I, I, I don't disagree at all to continue um, the pathway that we looked at going forward with. I don't know that we ever received any proposals uh, when we were looking to sell the property. Uh, I don't know how far we got, but I don't believe the interest was there to, for the amount of money that it would cost to actually purchase the facility. Um, so the easier way has been to continue moving forward with uh, working with our local nonprofits and, and providing the service there, but I don't think we should give up, uh, and I'll just be blunt, um, it would be nice to not have that liability as a county and to pass that on uh, to some other entity because there does come a liability with running shelters. Um, and at this moment in time, we're, we're, we're doing the best that we can with what we have. And so... Uh, okay. So um, item A is approve the use of the old juvenile hall facility located at 1111 Wayland Way for shelter operations. And it's, it sounds like there's still some discussions that need to happen, but you need this direction to move forward with the next conversations that need to happen. Is that correct? Yes, Chair, that's correct. Okay. Is there any more discussion um, from the board on item A? I will open it up for the public. If anyone wants to just talk, well, maybe we should just wait until, should I do public comment at the end all through? A, B, and C, or do it individually? Uh, your it's a little board, hard to dif differentiate each item. Yeah, your board has the option of doing them separately. Okay. I think I might do it at the end. So it can, the comments can be a little broader. Okay, so then um, B, request to waive competitive bidding based on section 38.21 and 42.2 state of emergency. Director Jones? Um, yes. 
In fact, the Lake County Continuum of Care did not receive the proposal for these interim shelter services uh, through an RFP. It is true that the county may accept proposals at any time absent an RFP process for consideration. It happens regularly with our department. Um, and so thus, due to the very short runway uh, that we had to ensure continuity of shelter services, this proposal was submitted to the COC um, absent that process and uh, we are requesting exemption based on um, 38.2 because it is there is still an emergency declaration in place. Okay. Anything from the board? Supervisor Spatier? And I can't find the exact date, but um, the anticipation was to extend the current contract that we have, which actually ends today. Um, but we received a letter of resignation or a letter of vacancy from the contractor, hence the timeline that was very short for us to be able to um, do the RFP process. Uh, we have done an RFP process with a contract that will be coming to the board um, within the next two months, uh, if not much sooner. And so um, the process has been fulfilled for the long term. This is a uh, interim fix. Thank you. That was a very eloquent explanation of a complex situation. Supervisor Crandall? Yeah. Find this contract. <clears throat> Is this the same doctor that was uh, the executive director for the last uh, group? That's correct. Okay. I just had that question. Supervisor Green? Yeah, thank you. Not a question just to, <clears throat> for those not fully immersed in all things continuum of care. So I believe uh, there was a general membership meeting of continuum care where this break, of, a potential break on services was discussed. Uh, the general membership did support examining alternatives. And I believe uh, this contract before us today has been reviewed by the executive committee of continuum of care, which actually has the oversight role and uh, I forget the exact date of the special meeting, but it is accurate to say that the Continuum of Care Executive Committee met and considered the contract proposal and uh, recommended funding it. That is correct. All right, thank you. Okay, any further comments on B? Then we'll move on to C. Consideration of agreement between the County of Lake and Behavioral Health Services as the lead administrative entity for the Lake County Con Continuum of Care and Blue Hi Horizons Foundation in the amount of $104,400 for fiscal year 2023-24. Um, yes, this is the contract for those services. It lasts 60 days from today if approved through December 24th, I believe. Is that 60 days? Yes. And uh, I would like to note that the contract the annual monthly payment for these services is the same. It has not differed from the previous vendor, which was Sunrise. So uh, it, it's, it, that, that remains, there's continuity there. So the costs haven't changed is what I'm trying to say. Comments? Supervisor Sabatier? Uh, again, um, a future consideration, but I do know that the consideration of the uh, three-year contract coming to us soon. Uh, it is anticipated that services will begin no later than December 15th. So just kind of want to show the December 24th deadline on this one and the anticipation to maybe cut that short and exchange it for the next contract. Um, just because I, I know that we've had comments here that it's supposed to close on Christmas Day. Now we have December 24th as the expiration date, but the anticipation is to bring that new contract to us so that there will be that trans transition. Thank you for that. And to add on to it, um, your board will be seeing that far in advance of December 24th. Um, the contract is uh, currently under review with our administrative office. And so I don't anticipate any issues with that. And it should be coming to you within the next couple of weeks, I would say. Okay, so the intent is uh, no stop at services. Correct. Okay. Any other comment from the board? All right, then now I, Supervisor Crandall. Um, Lars, I know we somewhat covered some of this in the um, space committee. Um, did, is there gonna be like a really thorough, uh, like I wanna say assessment of what's like in having issues with the facility? prior to the move-in or? 
So we've uh, we received a couple of well, we had a walkthrough with uh, uh, the chief building official. The county did, um, along with a walkthrough from uh, RCS, um, who provided some comments. Uh, we've we've already started on on taking away uh, some of those repairs again, which are just ongoing. They, they're not, you know, again, it's not turning it into a into a, a, a shelter um, you know, as, as if it was designed for that, but. Um, but we, we do, you know, we are making some headway on those. Um, I don't know if that, if that directly answers Yeah, that does, and I was just concerned that maybe if, uh, while this short-term contract is intact, do you think it would affect anything that we've assessed, or would it denigrate any more structural issues, or? Well, I, I, I hesitate to answer yes, because uh, you, you never know. You start uncovering, uncovering things, we go out there because uh, we think it's, a, it's a, uh, a leaking faucet, and then you find out that it's a bigger picture issue. So, uh, so possibly more to come. But, but based on the scope that, that we received and based on, on uh, staff's understanding, uh, knowledge of that facility already, um, uh, that, you know, I, I think we can handle the majority of those repairs um, uh, during this this phase, so I, I think the majority of those will be will be handled uh, before the December twenty fourth date. Um, uh, there are there are some other items that that might be uh, desires, so to speak, as opposed to you know leaks that are uh, that that are already we're aware of, or um, you know an HVAC system that isn't working. So uh, so those would be above and beyond anything that, that we're going to go out and be able to repair now. All right, thanks, Lars. Supervisor Swatier. So. I do want to speak to, to some of the concerns. Um, there have been some complaints. Uh, we've looked over all of and investigated all those complaints, but we uh, received more information even this morning in our emails. Um, I know that it doesn't necessarily affect the contract, but I still feel it's a conversation that's needed because finding out what is happening uh, from the perspective of a guest versus the perspective of a oversight of a contract perspective is really difficult to come down to the details. And so I'm, I'm just, I, I'm kind of going to put Director Jones on the spot. I think I know that she does have an answer to that, but it might be putting you on the spot. Is it possible for um, behavioral health to have a little bit more presence uh, during this interim time, uh, not full staffing or anything like that that I'm looking for, uh, but like we, um, with uh, Scott Abbott, I know that we would pass by on Fridays, and he did that more often than I did, uh, but we would pass by on Fridays. It was known that we would be coming. Um, is it possible to have a little bit more on-site presence during this interim uh, as we uh, get ourselves ready for the three-year contract because of the complaints that we have been receiving? The short answer is yes. The explanation is that, um, as I've stated before, behavioral health, this is not a mandate of our department, but we take this on. Um, and there is a lot of intersection with people who are served by the continuum of care and behavioral health clients. And we are interested always in protecting and serving our beneficiaries. And so to, so to the extent that we can be there to be present and support them in the context of the milieu, absolutely. And we have uh, increased already some presence there, um, even recently, today, this week, and are happy to continue to do that, both at scheduled and unscheduled times. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And then my last concern, and it's not a concern that's going to stop me from voting for this, but it is something that is aggravating uh, when it comes to these things. Um, we are seeing changes in the expenses, and some of these changes are in the upper admin areas of the contract, where now we're seeing that the shelter CEO will be receiving $10,500, and yet that shelter CEO most likely will be here once a month, not throughout the whole month. And this is one of my things that I just, it's a pet peeve of mine. It's not appropriate, but then we don't have people knocking on the door to do the same type of service. But at one point, I cannot keep doing this and I cannot keep saying yes to what just seems like taking advantage of the people that are being served as well as the money that is being uh, utilized from taxpayers through the state of California. Uh, to provide these types of services. And so I just have to call it out before I vote for it. Um, I'm not super comfortable with it, 
But at the same time, we need this interim because seeing people out on the street is not going to um, create a better positive outcome for any of the people in the shelter. And it's not going to create an, a, a better outcome for our community members, our business members, and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm kind of kind of tired of seeing those big numbers when you're taking care of people who have so little. Um, it just, it doesn't mark me well. So just had to make that statement. Well, what are the responsibilities for the role outside of the visits? I wonder if um, Dr. Ava, I mean, I can speak to that. Um, and, and that information is contained in the proposal where there's the scope of duties. And while the proposal itself was not on the item, um, I have, uh, it's available should anyone want to view that, and that might be a better place to source from. But if uh, Dr. Ava from Blue Horizons is on the Zoom, he may t prefer to speak to that. I don't know if that's appropriate. Yeah, he's or if got he his wait. hand up right now. Go ahead, Dr. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I uh, share the concerns with, uh, you know, uh, Supervisor Sabatier, but also the scope of uh, my uh, duties does not limit to my uh, physical presence there, as I have reiterated many times. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the responsibility of that shelter falls on my shoulder. Uh, I am in touch with my staff on a daily basis. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in their staff meetings uh, and and whatever is going on behind the scenes, such as even putting together this proposal, is uh, solely my responsibility. And um, also, uh, it's uh, again, it's understandable uh, uh, your concerns, uh, but the uh, number of years of experience that I bring to the table, uh, my education, uh, and uh, and my resume speaks for itself. And this is generally not anywhere close to the regular salary that I request from any employers. But again, this is a public service, and this is something that I, uh, you know, I wanted, I was passionate about to do for the community. And as as I had promised, that I would I would help with the transition. Um, so um, I appreciate that, but it's uh, but again, uh, uh, the scope of my responsibilities does not limit to just my presence there physically. Um, it, it goes way, way beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Green. Thank you. Um, sheltering is hard, and uh, we've been learning as we go for the past three years through multiple vendors. The only reason we're here today is because the current vendor uh, pulled up short and uh, took advantage of a, a termination date, and that's well within uh, the right of Sunrise to do that. And if we're going to uh, try to discount um, the wisdom of adequately paying the shelter manager, who not only stood up in Sunrise's time of need, but having been made aware of the termination date, stood up a brand new company and offer to make good on his promise to keep this shelter open during the transition. Uh, so if we want to take a look and go line item on what an appropriate shelter management contract looks like, starting with Redwood and go until the cows come home after that, absolutely let's do that. I don't think today it's appropriate or helpful to be uh, second guessing that particular line item or any line item. This is not outside the realm of reasonability. Uh, second thing about the shelter building itself, uh, I have talked with staff and I'll continue to talk with staff, certainly uh, to the extent we're going to take that old building and any deferred maintenance and try to milk another two to three years out of it under the new contract, that's cool. Um, I have asked that uh, because it is an old correctional facility, because it is a place where we used to warehouse and confine juvenile offenders. Um, that justice involved individuals who receive shelter there should not be uh, subjected to the secondary trauma of going to an old jail as the last and only refuge Lake County has to offer for our unhoused individuals. 
So I believe it is appropriate, uh, even if it is not the most pressing maintenance need that may attend this building, um, that there are certain cosmetic changes that can and should be made sooner than later so that when uh, Redwood does get in there, uh, we're going to have a kinder, gentler facility, even if it is not uh, fully functional as far as the old systems in there. So uh, I just wanted to highlight those two things. I, I'm definitely interested in hearing about additional building maintenance needs and making sure we fine tune whatever uh, process has need to be put in place so that uh, uh, you know BH is not put in the position of being a full-time property manager and buildings and grounds is not you know saddled unfairly with a, an old dog building. Um, but let's make sure for the time we're going to be in that old dog building that it is an appropriate place, a safe place, a welcoming place for our uh, shelter residents. And uh, I also want to uh, highlight that, again, this is an extension of basically the warming shelter concept. So this is going to be our last iteration of an overnight shelter or warming shelter or whatever you're going to call it. But I look very much forward to the next contract where we're going to be able to expand operations 24 hours, uh, knowing in advance that's just going to tax this building that much more when we put that additional load on there. So uh, I'm super excited about this. I know there are concerns uh, about the prior operator and two operators before that, and there's probably going to be concerns with this contract. But glass half full, we are getting people off the streets. I have heard feedback constantly from the city of Lakeport. I just got feedback from Scotts Valley Community Council last night about the importance of this shelter. And uh, so it's uh, uh, full speed ahead for me. Supervisor Crandall. It's the last thing. I wasn't going to say this, but I will. Um, I think it's just frustrating because it upsets me that there's entities and groups that take opportunities to exploit tragic epidemics like this. And it seems like we're always rinsing and repeating another group. I find no fault with the continuum of care or behavioral health as they have no other option but to continue with the funding they have. I just hope that one day we can get to a point where there's other groups trying to push forward and do the right thing to help people. Um, and it's not just homelessness, and I don't mean to stray off, but it's all sorts of other things. People use veterans. People use animals, fish, you know, um, opioids, mental health. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different things that are exploited, and it's frustrating because in a small county like ours, it's always exploited. And so I, that's just my frustration, and it's hard for me to support things like this, but I know we're in need of it. So... I just had to say it with the words that you said, Supervisor Sabate. I didn't want to say it. I was just going to go forward, but I just felt the need to be said. Okay, so I have one other question, and I know this has come up um, off and on. Um, because this is a county-owned facility and because we we're operating under an emergency and we had talked about selling the building, um, and I'm hoping Director Turner can pop on for a minute and talk about the zoning issues um, around this property and, Thank you. and compliant use. Currently, the building is a county-owned building. The county is exempt from our zoning regulations. Um, it's currently zoned, I think it's open space with a general plan designation of public facilities. Neither of those would allow for an emergency shelter um, were this not a county-led project. So as the county considers transitioning this building over to private ownership through the declaration of surplus, which would require a general plan conformity determination, as well as I think the state law requires it to be listed um, on, on some kind of master list for housing possibilities. Uh, but provided it gets all through that, what you would end up with, should this be purchased by a private party with the intention of establishing or continuing shelter operations would be a legal non-conforming use. So that would require, in order for a private entity to expand or change or modify the use in any way, it would require a rezone to um, probably, I think rural residential was the last, what was uh, the determination that I, I was talking to Supervisor Green, I think, about this over the last few months off and on. So a rezone to, I think, rural residential, as well as a general plan um, uh, amendment uh, to something uh, that was consistent with rural residential. And then 
so long as it qualified, we could transition it over to a um, uh, housing uh, navigation center, which would then be a ministerial action in that location. So it would require a process, um, permits, initial study for CEQA, uh, which is required with any general plan amendment. And uh, so it would be a process, but so long as the project remains county led and contracted to a private entity, we're still okay. Thank you so much for that explanation. My pleasure. If I could just want to enter one okay. caveat though, sorry, um, we're okay with the zoning restrictions. However, building um, permits, you know, we, Lars is, is very good about staying in contact with our, our chief building official to make sure that, that anything the building needs is uh, done according to code. Well, I'm, and I'm glad you said that because I was going to comment the same, that land use is one thing, but occupancy uh, of the facility is, is something um, uh, different and, and uh, could be above and beyond. So we'll need to continue on that path. Okay. Thank you both. Supervisor Green. Yeah, I just add to that. Um, there is some flexibility available for uh, health and safety standards, should we need them. Uh, so for example, if the price tag starts running up too crazy um, for improvements that might be needed to bring us up to full code compliance. There, there is flexibility provided in, in the uh, emergency shelter regulations that we could uh, propose alternative health and safety regulations that would provide a minimal level of health and safety. Uh, I haven't heard anybody really dive in jumping up and down to get on that bandwagon. So I guess as we move through the deferred maintenance list and, and we get the uh, the checklist from building and fire and whoever else needs to weigh in again, um, if we need those flexibilities to affordably operate this facility, we can take a look at that. But for right now, it seems to be uh, everyone's just kind of curious to see what can be done under, under just uh, uh, application of any uh, building and safety codes or fire codes that may need to happen right now. Uh, out there. So it, it could be an ongoing discussion, but as of right now, it sounds like everyone just wants to see where the uh, checklist take us. Okay, so I'm going to open it up for public comment now. If you would like to come up and speak, you can come to the podium, have three minutes, and um, state your name. Good afternoon, Yvonne Cox. Over the weekend, I received a video from a guest from inside the shelter and several pleas from people inside the shelter asking me to come and speak for them, telling you about the conditions. There's no toilet paper. There's no food. Now, mind you, Dr. Ava has cut many jobs, so there should be plenty of money for food. And not only that, if this man is so wise, why didn't he do his homework and do a background before he put a 27-year-old predator in the place to hurt somebody, and then to hurt somebody again, and then to hurt somebody again? and cover it up. Instead of firing the person, they were demoted. To me, this is ludicrous. I'm selling everything I have and getting out of this county. It's corrupt. It's sad to think that people put lining their pockets before taking care of the people. It, it's not right. Dr. Ava, I believe, my personal opinion, is here because he thinks this is untapped money that he can come in and take just like the other companies from out of county. They're going to come in, take the money, and run. Meanwhile, guess who's suffering? The people that need the help the most. I have uh, the video and several pleas of me asking, because any time that they speak up and say something, they're retaliated on. The guests get retaliated. They lose their room. They lose a privilege. Some get extra privileges. Some get no privileges. The food is ferocious. So, just wanted to share that with you. And I'd be glad to uh, email you all the video and the text conversations of them pleading to let you know their side and that they're afraid to say anything for fear of retaliation. And to let another person come in from out of county and take advantage, shame on you. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Nicole Pagan. I am the current director of the Lakeport Emergency Warming Shelter. I have been the director for about two and a half months to three months. And within those two and a half and three months, I have made a lot of changes. A lot of changes that have helped residents more than they've ever been helped in the last eight months. 
I have done nothing, but um, I connected with the Redwood Food Bank order, and we make orders weekly. We have fridges and freezers stocked full of food at all times. We always make sure they have the proper hygiene products that they need on stock at all hands, and I make sure they are safe because that is my job. Yes, I started off as the chef. I went to culinary school. I fell in love with this job. I fell in love with my people. To me, they are not homeless. They are my family, and I take care of my family. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Board. Uh, Brad Rasmussen. I'm the Lakeport Police Chief. Uh, here speaking on behalf of the police department in the city of Lakeport today. Um, I think it's clear there's a lot of complexities that need to be worked on and figured out down the road, but you know, today the concern is whether or not we're gonna have a shelter tomorrow. And uh, you know, if we don't continue an operation, you know, through the interim in December when the next contractor takes over, that's going to have devastating effects not only to the unhoused population but also the rest of the Lakeport community and specifically businesses and other um, uh, folks downtown in Lakeport. So um, we're in favor of uh, uh, seeing this continue, this, this gap be filled with the uh, interim contract until the next one can take over. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in the chambers? Do we have anyone in Zoom? We have one hand up. Dr. Ava? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to, I, I'm, I'm sure she's already gone, but, but Ms. Yvonne Cox, I just want to remind her that she's under a season disease letter for defamatory comments in, in public. And uh, I, both not only from Sunrise perspective, but also from me personally. Uh, so there will definitely be precautions, legal precautions, if she continues with her defamatory comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, if there's no more public comment and I'm not seeing any, then I will bring it back to the board for action. Can I just, uh, oh, one yes. more statement ahead, before we move forward? Sure, Supervisor. Um, is there a way like we can get um, data showing, I don't know, success? I mean, I know we've had two different groups that have just basically kind of left. Did they, did they leave any data showing success or the challenges or anything like that? And if we move forward from here, from here on, can we have that so that when we look at new contracts, we can say, well, with this group, we were here, with this group, we were here, and with this group, we went down, or whatever the case may be. Yes, so presently, Sunrise and um, should the contract be awarded, Blue Horizons and additionally Redwood Community Services must all participate in the Homeless Management Information System, uh, known as HMIS, where they report on um, a variety of factors related to beneficiaries of housing services, including dispositions of where they went um, in housing and things of that nature. And so certainly we're happy to per report on those performance metrics. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to see them when we have these further, you know, re, you know, reapprovals and things like that, so we can just know. I wonder um, if your board would consider even a presentation. I don't know if it's been done from the Lake County Continuum of Care on various yeah, data points. Like that, yeah. Yep, good idea. Good. Okay. Uh, Supervisor, I was going to just make the statement that we get those reports uh, on a man monthly basis. M M HMIS information as to what's been submitted. Um, it was a slow start at the beginning uh, in order to get the right identification number, in order to try to uh, put everything on the computer. But in the last, I want to say, six months, uh, maybe that's too short of a time period, but in the last six months, it's been much more accurate and much more consistent uh, that it's been inputted. Uh, I know that they hired somebody specifically to do HMIS, and she seems to be doing a, a fantastic job. Thank you. I, I will um, plan to, when we bring forward the resolution, be for authorizing behavioral health and the MOU between the COC and behavioral health. Um, would your board prefer to see a presentation of data from the COC at that time? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. And so you, you mean, Supervisor Spatier, you mean the, the continuum sees the data, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Are you ready? Supervisor Green? 
Yeah. If there's no further comment, this is in my district, and I'd be very proud to, uh, to go through the recommended actions. Only last comment is uh, it's easy to cast stones here, and for one person to uh, cast stones about current shelter management having endured a fair number of complaints against herself doesn't seem especially fair or helpful. With that comment, I move to approve the use of the old juvenile hall facility located at 1111 Whalen Way in Lakeport, California for continued emergency shelter operations. You got to waive the competitive bidding. I was going to take them one at a time. Oh, sorry. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Next, I move to approve the request to waive competitive bidding based on section 38.2 per N1 and 42.2 based on the state of emergency. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And finally, I move to approve the agreement between the County of Lake Behavioral Health Services as the lead administrative entity for the Lake County Continuum of Care and Blue Horizons Foundation in the amount of $104,400 for fiscal year 2023-24 and authorize the board chair to sign. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, so we are going to take our lunch break. I wanna make a correction when I asked about um, any action taken out of closed session, it was not for item 8.2, it was for item 8.3. So, so that's what you said. I thought you said I think, 8.3. I think I said 8.2. Well, but anyway. It's clear now. All right, all right. I didn't want there to be any um, misconceptions about what we had worked on. So we will come back at 1.15 for our one o'clock item. We'll see everyone then, thanks. Okay, welcome back. We are going to start with our 6.7, 1 p.m. item, consideration of report to the Board of Supervisors explaining the emergency conditions that necessitated the summary abatement for the property located at 10305 Hoke Has Ha Lane, Kelseyville, APN number 043-34307. I'm gonna pass this over to Community Development. Thank you, Mireya Turner, Community Development Director. Uh, the summary abatement report will be handled by our Code Enforcement Manager. Good, good afternoon, my name is Marcus Beltramo. I'm the Code Enforcement Manager for the Community Development Department. Uh, today we are here to give a, meet a statutory requirement to provide a report when a summary abatement is conducted um, we statutorily we require to provide a report at the next B, uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, and that's what is occurring here today. Uh, again, the property is 10305 Hawk Ha Lane in Kelseyville. Um, we provide a map here. I think the map's important. Um, the property outlined in yellow is the subject property. I want to make note and mention directly to the southwest of that property is a wetland a pond uh, in direct uh, proximity to the property and that was part of our concern. Uh, the code section here for summary abatements in chapter uh, 13, um, this basically just outlines the conditions for summary abatement and the rules. Uh, also references chapter five as part of the process there. As part of the process, we provide a 48 summary, uh, notice of summary abatement to the owners, letting them know that uh, the conditions require immediate abatement. Again, a summary abatement is a uh, immediate issues, health and safety issues, and that's what we were addressing here in this situation. In our 48 hour notice, we cited the following public nuisance violations. Um, chapter 13, Article 1, Section 13-3.1, uh, should be subdivision, subsection E4, any condition dangerous to human life, unsafe or detrimental to public health or safety, any use of land, buildings, or premises established, operate, or maintained contrary to the provisions of Chapter 13, Chapter 5, and Chapter 21. Specifically in Chapter 5, the IPMC, the International Property Maintenance Code, uh, subsection 7, existence of garbage, rubbish, refuse, uh, waste matter, contrary to the provisions of chapter 921 or which creates a fire hazard, which creates a fire hazard is one of the issues involved here today. 
any items causing unsightly appearance which is visible from the scenic corridor, public right of way, sites of neighboring properties, or which provides harbors for rats or other vermin, which is another issue involved here today, or creates other potential health hazard or a public nuisance. These are the issues cited in the 48-hour notice. There is additional basis for the summary abatement. Uh, under the California Health and Safety Code 17920.3, subdivision A, uh, this is the substandard building code under the California Health and Safety Code uh, subdivision, subsection 5, lack of hot and cold running water to the plumbing or fixtures in the dwelling unit, infestation of insects, vermins, or rodents. Um, Subdivision J there, those premises on which an accumulation of weeds, vegetation, junk, dead organic matter, debris, garbage, awful rodent harborages, stagnant water, combustible materials, and similar materials or conditions constitute a fire health and safety hazard. We believe the issues here today meet those three requirements or elements, fire, health, and safety hazards. Um, from the IPMC, that's the International Property Maintenance Code, um, we cite section 302.1, sanitation. Exterior property and premises shall be maintained in a clean, safe, and sanitary condition. The occupant shall keep that part of the exterior property that such occupant occupies or control, controls in a clean, sanitary condition. Uh, 32, or 302.5, rodent harbinger, harborage. Structures and exterior property should be kept free from rodent harborage and if infestation where rodents are found, they shall be promptly exterminated by approved processes that will not be injur injurious to human health. After pest elimination, proper precautions should be taken to limit rodent harborage and prevent reinfestation. Three, we also cited section of the IPMC 305.1, the interior of a structure and equipment therein shall be maintained in good repair structurally sound and in a sanitary condition. The issues here were not in a sanitary condition. Uh, occupants shall keep that part of the structure that they occupy or control in a clean sanitary condition. Every owner of a structure containing a rooming house, housekeeping units, a hotel, dormitory, two or more dwelling units or two or more non-residential occupancy shall maintain in a clean and sanitary condition the shared or public areas of the structure and exterior of the property. Also in the IPMC is another rubbish or uh, garbage code we cited, or the basis is section uh, 308.1. And then the last section we uh, had a basis for the summary abatement is the IPMC subdivision BE 702.1. A safe, continuous, and unobstructed path of travel should be provided from any point in the building or structure to the public way. Means of egress shall comply with the International Fire Code. That was an issue here as well that required immediate abatement. Now I'm going to provide the evidence to support the uh, summary abatement. The pictures you're seeing here are on the front porch. Um, first off, I just want to say when you approach the property, there was a foul, strong odor emanating from the property. You could smell it from the street. You could smell it pulling down onto Ha Cos Ha Lane. You could smell the odor. It was that strong. Um, I also want to mention Code Officer Chris Colin and Chris uh, Code Enforcement Supervisor Norman Valdez were on site. They can also uh, testify to their direct observations as to the noxious odor or foul odor that emanated. Each room had its own distinct strong odor. Uh, on the picture there on the left, you can see the exposed trash to the elements. It's not properly bagged or containerized. That is a health issue. Uh, here's further pictures to kind of uh, demonstrate the uh, garbage and trash that's exposed to the elements. The back deck, this is what's on the back deck. This is all saturated. Uh, contaminated, unsanitary conditions, exposed elements of the trash. A lot of the uh, materials, items that were abated were saturated and covered in urine, dog feces, rat feces, and therefore uh, were deemed to be immediate. And I also want to mention uh, the wetlands is directly behind this back deck. There's a backyard and then the wetlands start. The interior of the property, um, just for a little bit of background, uh, we came to the property, we saw the outside of the property based on our training experience. We had reasonable belief there were more additional 
uh, uh, violations occurring that were immediate. So in order to understand the extent and the scope of those issues, uh, we obtained an inspection warrant and went, that's how we got these pictures. Only from the, inspect, the information obtained through the inspection warrant uh, did we request a summary abatement. And here are photos of the inside. The left is a mattress covered and saturated in urine and other type of uh, unsanitary uh, liquids or materials. On the right is shelving. And why I put this picture in here is if you could see the little pellets, those are all rat feces. And that was throughout the entire house. Here's some more pictures on the left. You can see that's a bathroom and I guess a hallway to the bathroom, but exposed trash, rubbish, garbage. Also, that is a fire issue. It impedes the egress. And on the right, you can see the rodent or vermins, how they're chewing through the wall. The area in front of the holes, although it's not the greatest picture, is still covered in rat feces. To the left again is a, I believe it's the same bathroom, just a different angle. On the right, you can see the trash, garbage, rubbish, all in there, unbagged, uncontainerized, exposed to the elements, along with rat feces and dog feces. And Marcus, these um, these are inoperable bathrooms because there's no water. Yeah, so the water, uh, we did speak with the uh, occupants. So there's three property owners. One occupant was uh, actually occupying the house. Um, they admitted the water had been disconnected. They were using a potable water source around the corner to get water. Uh, we did call the water company and confirmed it. They were delinquent and um, it didn't appear that they, they couldn't demonstrate they had the financial means to get the water back on. So yes, the water was turned off. It had been turned off for some time. Um, I believe my officers can comment to the period it had been turned off. Um, but there was no water to clean, uh, no water to flush the toilets. But I'm not here today about the toilets, um, which were in an ins unsanitary state, but yes, the water was turned off. We did red tag the property as, immediately as, uh, as soon as we discovered that or established that was occurring. Um, again, on the left, just miscellaneous uh, items. On the right, um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me walk out that back. So when we went into the house, two rooms were barricaded. So on the left, if you see on the back there, that is a mattress covering up a doorway. And so we had to remove that. That's also an emergency egress. If they have to get out, they have, can't get out through that room. It's barricaded. Behind that mattress, as you can see on the left, is the left corner of the mattress, is the stuff behind it. And then that's what was behind that mattress and that door. Again, that bed is covered in dog feces, I believe. Um, it's saturated with urine. There's a strong odor emanating from it. They basically had closed that room off. The second room that was barricaded was the garage. On the left is the inside of the house. The garage door is off to the right. The picture on the right is when you are able to open the door and there's the trash behind it. If they had to get out through the garage, they could not. They would have, there's five feet of trash stacked in the garage. And we will provide evidence of the garage issues later on here in this presentation. Here's another picture of the door of the garage. The reason I put this picture in here is it gives you a better idea. If you look down to the bottom, to the right, that's used toilet paper. That's what's in that garage, along with other unsanitary materials. This, this is when the garage was, we were able to finally open the garage. We could not go through the inside of the house. We had to open the garage, which was a task in itself. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's out there is the stuff from the back porch and the inside. But I just, these pictures just tell you how much trash and uh, unsanitary materials. And I do want to iterate, the summary abatement is only for those immediate issues. There's still a lot of stuff there that we did not take. We just determined we had a basis to take this and we needed to, uh, to, to do an immediate summary abatement to remove the immediate health and safety issues. Can I ask a question? Sorry. Can I ask a question? Let me just turn it off. Can I ask a question about the garbage here? You said it's from the, did you move it to the front? So the, the contractors took it off the back porch and from the inside of the house and they put it there so they could use their excavator to put it into the dumpster. Okay, so when you arrived to the house, the garage door was closed and the there was no garbage was on the outside? 
I'm sorry. Yes, the garage door was closed and could not be opened. But there was no garbage outside? The garbage was on the front porch area that we observed initially. Okay. It's only when we did the inspection work did we find these conditions on the back porch and inside the house. Okay, so ju just to again be clear, the garbage that's in the front was not there. The garage door was closed. This is garbage from the back side that was brought to the front to make it easy for the contractors to do the cleanup. Okay. What this, I guess the best way to uh, put this I in, assume that this is how it was found when I went through the pictures originally, so I, that's why I just wanted to clarify. I apologize. It was no, not my intent no, to no, mislead. No um, I think this picture just kind of gives you the scope of the unsanitary issues that were abated, um, and I apologize for that. And as you can see, this is a closer up picture and you can see the unsanitary material, food items, trash and garbage that were being stored in the house on the back porch and in the garage area. Um, just to kind of give you a kind of uh, elaborate on your issue before about the garage door, one of the contractors had to climb through that door that was open, climb through that to get the switch there so the garage door could be pulled open. Um, also, With the short straw. I, uh, <laughs> I also want to mention in the garage were several rats' nests. When they moved the piles, the rats would just scatter all throughout the house. What these photos here are of the electric, electrical in the garage. And the rats were gnawing through the outside of the wires and were getting to the wire itself. Now, remember, the garage is stacked with five feet high of trash and garbage. Um, they cannot get out. There's no one that can get in there to repair the wires. Um, the rats are chewing at them. If a fire, if a spark does happen, there's a lot of materials there that could, we're at a fire risk. And we believed, so we abated this one for the health and safety issues, two for the emergency egress issues, uh, eliminate the potential fire risk issues. Um, in my experience, I've seen a lot of these properties in this county and the conditions here in my experience were leading up to a possible fire. And, um, so I just wanted to have that picture in the, to further substantiate the need for the immediate summary abatement in the garage area. Um, we hired Lenners Hauling to do the abatement. The total abatement cost was $6,687.35. That does not include cost recovery. We're not here for a lien hearing. This is just to kind of give you a report. Uh, we will be coming with, forward with a lien hearing after the second notice expires and if we have to abate it again. Um, Lucky for us, the property is in foreclosure. Well, I, let me walk that back. The property is in foreclosure. There's an asset management company that is uh, taking possession of the property for the pre-foreclosure process. They've reached out to us and they've said they'll bait the remaining issues and pay the cost for the lien and our cost recovery. What is the timeline for that? For, I'm sorry. For the asset management company to continue the abatement. My concern is the rats are in the walls and there's probably a lot of other wires that have been chewed up and so they're off PG and e. First you want to speak to that? So Chris has been dealing directly with the asset management company. He can give you the best information of what their steps they're gonna take. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Christopher Colin, Code Enforcement Officer with County of Lake. Um, so the house has a 30-day uh, notice of violation, 30-day uh, notice of nuisance order to abate, um, which has been relayed to the property preservation uh, company, Cypress Services. Um, they have to issue a 48-hour notice uh, to uh, occupants uh, to make sure that the property is clear, and then they can start moving. There's forward. no one occupying that property. No, no, but that's part of their process. due process. It, it would be a, a, a procedural yeah. issue. I'm just making sure. <laughs> uh, uh, so they, they have indicated that uh, they uh, have a large interest in uh, negating any further fees or encumbrances on the property, and they want to actually take care of um, the costs already uh, associated with the property and clean up um, before it is actually leaned against the title. So uh, fin financially, uh, they seem to be very motivated. Uh, so I, I believe uh, they should be acting before the 30 days expires on both notices. So, so we don't have a definitive date, but it seems like they want to get this taken care of. Um, so I don't have a date to give you a specific and date. we'll be recovering these costs. Uh, so the uh, pr asset management or pr preservation company has already talked to us. I already, I'm sending them the invoices now for the contractor's fee. I told them we'll send them a task sheet with our cost recovery for uh, Chris's time and Norman's time as well. And so um, I told him it's looking about to be about ten, eleven thousand dollars, but we will provide invoices. They said they would pay that. Okay. 
So um, again, we're just going at their word, but we will be sending the charges to them and they indicated they will pay those charges. And that was a conversation we had by via phone this morning. Okay. Um, total weight abated 11,720 pounds. Um, this is a high amount compared for normal summary abatements, but we feel the issues here are, are justified and um, needed to occur to avoid further issues. Um, here are the invoices. Um, basically, six thousand dollars for the. This was a two-day abatement. Uh, six thousand dollars the first day. Six hundred thirty. I think it's six hundred eighty-seven dollars and thirty-five cents for the second day. Um, I also also want to. Uh, give a report that there was assistance provided. Lake County Sheriff offered assistance. They did cite occupants that were in the red tag property. Animal control was also called out to the property. We found 18 dogs on the property, one boa constrictor, and feeder mice and rats also, in addition to the rats and vermin that were part of the garbage. Uh, Animal control, I don't believe, took these animals, but they did go through their processes and they did assist us with making sure that they're in a better place. Oh my God. 18 little dogs. I know, but 18 dogs. I just wanted- Were they barricaded in those rooms? Uh, um, there was one room where nine dogs, nine small dogs uh, were all inhabiting. Uh, the other dogs were in kennels and then there were about three that uh, were kind of free roaming and there was two larger dogs in the backyard. Were they breeding dogs in all of this? Um, I, I believe they were all um, capable of breeding, but I, I don't know. We don't have any evidence yeah. to support okay. any there breeding. Was a breeding current. activity going on. Oh, okay. Well, this, this information was not part of our packet. I apologize. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. It's just I thought information and material yep. to the report, and I also wanted to uh, also acknowledge the assistance provided. You know, code enforcement, a lot of times we don't operate in a vacuum. We have issues. Um, all right, so um, that being said, um, we do not have, staff does not have a recommend, recommendation at this time. Uh, basically, we're just meeting the statutory requirement of providing a report, although any... Uh, uh, comments or direction from the board would be appreciated, uh, but we're just meeting the statutory requirement at this time. And that ends the presentation. Well, when you sent these to me last week, it was, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful that you were able to move so quickly and get this done. And this was a hard, hard job for your team. And I have deep, deep gratitude that you all did it because this, had to have been one of the worst things that you've possibly ever done. So thank you so much for doing that and taking care of this problem and moving so, so quickly. I don't know if anyone else has it. Uh, Supervisor Green. Yeah, I don't know if it's even a good inquiry given the laundry list of violations, but where I saw a vehicle, were there any inoperable or dismantled vehicles that need to be abated? So this is a summary abatement. We're only abating the immediate issues. A vehicle in this sense did not, we did not feel met that criteria. Um, I believe the car. There, there is one vehicle still left on the property. Uh, it is movable under its own power, but it has a shredded tire. Again, we, we were very careful and diligent and we acted in, uh, very responsibly here. We made sure with the contractors were only taking those issues that we believe to be unsanitary and immediate health and safety issues. Uh, Chris, and Joey spent the day, you know, whole day at the property ensuring that we did not go above and beyond what is allowed for a summary abatement. And a second question, I know that's not an action item and I'm, I'm looking at the code here, uh, chapter 13 to see, uh, when you have violations of the severity and scale, um, I don't see it in chapter 13, but maybe elsewhere in the health and safety code, is there any ability or opportunity when coming across situations like this of, of uh, you mentioned the sheriff was out um, at some point, and I don't know who the responsible parties are, I'm glad somebody's like bending over backwards, say we'll pay for it now, but between the owner and the renter and whatever responsible parties are attached to this property, uh, I, I don't know, you know, if there's any potential for misdemeanor referrals or something like that, but is there anything within the, the 
the toolbox that code enforcement has that would allow analysis of whether whether it's this violation or not or some equally serious or even more serious violation that it would not just be a summary abatement followed by the standard nuisance abatement process but maybe also an, a referral to law enforcement. Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to comment on behalf of the sheriff's office or the district attorney's office. Um, that is something that is something we could make a referral on. Um, it would be up to them to determine how they would proceed. But I can't comment on their behalf. But and I I don't want to uh, make a comment on the appropriateness of it. But um, right. I'm sure, a referral maybe, can be maybe when there's not a case specific thing. You know, it, it's just something that yeah. uh, for for I, us um, immediacy was the issue. Um, this took about two weeks to go through this whole process from s receiving a complaint, seeing it, doing the inspection warrant, getting our contractors out there. Um, up in the future, if we come across a property of this uh, uh, magnitude or in this condition, we will definitely involve the sheriff's office and uh, um, let them make a determination. Yeah, the, the sheriff was there uh, to provide assistance in the execution of the inspection warrant. Also, the property was continued to be occupied by the occupants, so the sheriff's office did cite them. I appreciate the sheriff's office for citing someone for staying in an occupied uh, red-tagged house. So um, in the future, it's something we'll consider and make sure uh, and, and make that referral. All right. Thank you. Supervisor Spatier. <clears throat> I always appreciate whenever we do a cleanup, but I do have some questions on this. Um, I'm not going to say that an, it's an exact replica, but I can't help but think of like Barrel Way, where it was an absolute disaster there. Uh, at what and and doing summary abatements increases our potential liability risk rather than going through the standard process. Um, is this a new pathway that you're kind of looking into to try to utilize? Because uh, I'm just trying to figure out why here and not in other places, and how do we how do we get a better understanding of when yes, um, because it's a um, yes there is a uh, marshland or a uh, sensitive habitat, but. Places like Barrel Way also have neighbors within range that are impacted by this. Um, so I'm just kind of curious how we can either utilize this more and make sure the risk remains as low as possible, or what made this special in comparison uh, to other things that we've seen that are absolutely just disturbing. So the summary abatement criteria is uh, of a higher standard than our nuisance abatement procedure. We have to, it, it's not a decision that we just make within our department, but when, when our code enforcement staff has observed something that, that they think qualifies as an immediate public health and safety threat, uh, not just a nuisance, that is when they will pursue, um, that's when they will come back. And it requires uh, conferring and agreement with county council, the chair or the supervisor of that district, as well as the director, uh, me. Um, and so if all are in agreement, that is when we move forward. So we did do that as well recently um, for Kugelman only specific to the illegal electrical work that was done because that portion of the overall project was deemed to be an immediate health, public health and safety threat. And so it could be that, um, I don't want to speak to, to the different cases specifically, but sometimes when we start with a nuisance abatement, if we don't see an immediate public health and safety threat, not a nuisance itself, but something that rises to the level of, of an actual danger to the public, um, then we may will continue with the due process um, system of the nuisance abatement. So summary abatement is not a new thing, um, but as the I'm sure the board can understand, when our uh, staff did start reviewing this complaint case, uh, it was clear that this was not similar. This was not the same as what would normally be a nuisance abatement. However, as, uh, as uh, Manager Beltramo has stated, our staff was extremely careful to limit the abatement of the summary abatement items to that which was deemed to be the immediate threat. And the case remains ongoing through the nuisance abatement process for the rest of the items. Though I'm sure the rest of the items are as objectionable to the neighborhood as what has already been cleared to date. 
Well, and it's not about nuisance objection to the neighborhood. It's about meeting that specific threshold of endangering, endangering the neighborhood. Indeed. Uh, so it's not about how many loud voices you have out there. It's about a specific uh, criteria. Yes. I'd like to comment. Um, it, it's, well, it's the general welfare of the occupants and the surrounding neighborhood. So you have to look at it in a, from a to, the, the totality of the issues, and then you throw in the environmental issue. But to give, answer your question specifically, what this is an example of, it's, this is our training and our experience. This is a maturing code enforcement unit with experienced code enforcement officers who see these things, know how to address these things, know the laws and the tools allowed to us. To, you know, when, we, when you pull up on the scene, you don't see all this stuff in the house. Based on our training experience, we said, we have reason to believe there's something bigger going on here because we see this all the, we've seen this over the last one, two years. We knew, we had reason to believe there were more in there. So this is a maturing code enforcement unit. When we come across these things, we are going to push and make sure they're not additional or um, greater issues that affect the health and safety. Um, if we just left it at the front, this would have continued. And again, in my experience, this probably would have ended up in a fire because we've seen it two or three times on other properties throughout the county. So what this is indicative of, in my opinion, is experienced officers who have the training and understand how to get the job done. So that would be my opinion of what, why this happened and it didn't happen in other situations. Okay. Um, and then my, my, I guess my last question, um, don't you have the power to shut down PG&E to a house rather than walking away and thinking there might be rats still in the walls that might be chewing on the wires? It's already red tag, so nobody should be in there. So I would suspect, I, I know our, our fire departments can shut down PG&E when there's like a fire or an incident that they're dealing with. Don't you have similar powers? So the building official has that ability. Um, I apologize, it did not cross my mind in this instance here. There were a lot of moving parts. Um, Remember, we're not just focusing on this. We have other code enforcement issues we also are dealing with at the same time. So um, I appreciate that, bringing that to attention, and that's something else we'll build on in the future and make sure to uh, make sure that doesn't occur. Um, also, I'd have to think about it, too, to review the facts if we have a basis to cut power immediately. Um, I'd have to review that code and see if the criteria occurring there meets that standard. But um, I think that's a good point. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. I mean, the reason is the pictures and the comment from the chair, uh, which is you didn't get rid of all the vermin. You have proof that the vermin is already chewing on the wires. And so leaving it on and allowing that to continue while you wait for this process of uh, foreclosure and whatnot to occur, at least it would limit the potential for another hazard to be created. I agree. I I think the way I perceived it is that we had rat's nests in the garbage. I think by removing that, we lessened it. Um, I think your point is valid as well. Um, so again, when it comes to code enforcement issues, you can see the multitude and of issues that are involved in this and how many different things we have to uh, interpret, digest, and then put into action. So I appreciate you bringing this to our attention and I think that's a valid concern, so yes. Supervisor Crandall. Is it also like with this situation uh, with the cooperative, you know, with the actual owner or, or the potential owner, is that what's making it a little more uh, possible to move forward? So or? there's three owners for the property. Mm -hmm. Two of them we could not locate. The one that we met on the initial site visit, um, I believe to be under the influence and was not really responsive. The occupant was 27 weeks pregnant. Um, and she was not willing to work with us. Um, so I can't really speak to that issue. I don't anticipate any cooperation. They would not sign, allow us to do an inspection initially. Um, they would not sign the right of entry, which is why we need an inspection warrant. I, um, again, if this was not a summary abatement, we would have just had to kind of go through the 30 days process. Uh, we do have tools to deal with uh, uh, property owners that are not cooperative. Um, in this instance, we use that tool. Um, so um, hopefully that answers your question. It does. It kind of leads me to a lot more uh, issues in places like this that uh, we, could, we could build off of, yeah, including Barrel Way. Thank you for mentioning that. I, 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 know it's I just want to make sure we 
treat every area equitably. And I think as we're learning, maybe we'll see that. I just I see Barrel Way as being a potential of being that same type of issue. So Barrel Way is coming in front of the board in two or three weeks for an appeal. So um, we can address that issue at that time. But yes, I appreciate you bringing. And I'm Barrel speaking about the one we've already done in the past. I have no oh. idea what's coming in the future. So uh, Barrel Way is a problem property. Um, according. Of course, it's not germane to this issue, and I don't want to get too yeah. sidetracked on that issue, but barrel way is a issue. Okay. Supervisor Green. Yeah, just very briefly, I did find that there is within Chapter 13 a uh, potential under 13.44 to bring forward an infraction or a misdemeanor charge in addition to any other remedy provided by Chapter 13. And although uh, we don't want to put our thumb on the scales of that, uh, your department is maturing, and so part of that maturation process may involve uh, some internal calculation as to when 13.44 uh, may apply. And uh, uh, again, without putting my thumb on the scale, what you have presented here today is serious. Uh, and and I, I don't even think this administrative misdemeanor under this, but again, that there may be other things with other codes involved here, uh, you know, without knowing the responsible parties or the property owners and all that, but the, not in addition to the deplorable conditions themselves uh, and knowing there are other properties in similar circumstance. Um, some, some days, and today would be that, is the imposition of administrative fines and penalties and due process for everyone seems wholly inadequate. Um, to the seriousness of the situation that's presented. So uh, I just uh, encourage you as you continue to mature, 13.44 just uh, came up on my radar and will certainly come up uh, when we get future appeals. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to open it up for public comment. I'm not seeing anyone in the chambers. Is there anyone in the Zoom room? Okay. This was a presentation to fulfill your statutory requirements. So thank you so much. No. I'm both thankful and I want to apologize to code enforcement staff for having to deal with this and confront it. That's disturbingly disgusting. Yeah. And the contractor that had to crawl across the garage. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> okay, thank you so much and thank you so much for your work. Our next item is 6.8, our 1.30 p.m. item, sitting as the Board of Directors of the Lake County Watershed Protection District, consideration of draft comment letter to the State Water Resources Control Board regarding draft emergency regulations proposed for the Clear Lake Watershed. This was, um, this was assigned by the board um, for supervisors Green and Sabatier to um, have some meetings and discussion and bring back a recommended um, draft letter for us to review and potentially submit. What? Supervisor Green, you want to start this off? Oh. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so in the agenda packet, we did uh, republish the uh, the notice and the workshop guide uh, put out by the state water boards. Uh, they were here last week with an in-person listening session, which uh, I attended with Supervisor Sabatier. Uh, also this morning at 10 a.m., there was a, uh, a virtual only workshop that repeated the same information. Uh, and we also attached the draft emergency regulations. Uh, we did take... Um, uh, uh, Supervisor Spatier uh, uh, and I worked uh, with departments, including water resources, uh, to uh, try to get uh, how, as a county, we may want to respond to these draft regulations. And uh, after that discussion, uh, there was some consensus that we should bring forward our comments uh, as the watershed protection district, as opposed to the county itself, or in the in the case of Big Valley, uh, under the guise of the Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability uh, Agency. Um, so, uh, and after much much discussion, we do have a draft letter presented for the board's consideration today, sitting as uh, the board of directors for the watershed district. 
Uh, I do want to say that uh, our Ag Advisory Committee also uh, took a first uh, look at these regulations uh, in their meeting, uh, did receive a communique from uh, Chair uh, Sharon Zoller, uh, ba basically uh, resending a comment letter that has already been filed with the water boards by the uh, California Farm Bureau and urging that uh, uh, we take notice of the Farm Bureau's letter and uh, uh, you know, express support for the bullet points within that letter. Um, and I think that's about I have right now, Supervisor Sabate, if you want to pick up where I left off. Yeah, so we did meet with the State Water Board, um, I want to say it was October 12th, something, something along those lines. Um, and right away there was an uh, offer of looking at um, lessening the scope by eliminating the uh, Upper Cache Creek area since the main focus uh, with the main interest uh, being uh, the hitch uh, to continue looking at the Middle Creek area, Scotts Valley area, and the whole Big Valley area uh, for those creeks of importance to ensure what f water flows look like and the, um, the interaction between groundwater extraction and water flow. Um, so we had those conversations. There was no yes, 100%, that's what they would want to do, but there was a uh, agreement from all parties that that was something that we can all agree to. Uh, so that's in the letter to eliminate the Upper Cache Creek area. Um, then we looked at the setbacks, which right now there are no setbacks. It's the entire Clear Lake watershed. Uh, it was brought to our attention here at our board meeting from Supervisor Simon about the Sonoma County uh, well ordinance. Uh, that was discussed as well in our communication outside of the board meeting. And the Sonoma County uh, well ordinance is uh, probably the most recent and the most, I'm going to say, arduous or restrictive of well ordinances in the state of California, and they use a maximum of 750 feet setbacks from creeks of importance. And so we utilized the 750 feet in our request to lessen the scope so that we're not asking folks outside of that area to uh, be a part of the study, to be burdened with the study. That does not mean that they can't volunteer to be a part of the study, uh, but as far as the information order that would be provided by the State Water Board, that it would be within that scope. Um, there is a request to uh, make the attempt to not use fines in order to uh, get to compliance. Um, and also there is a request in the letter to provide all the information that has been gathered and the uh, conclusion of the studies from um, all the data that they've gathered to be brought back to the local jurisdiction so that we can create a local ordinance ourselves rather than allowing, just basically saying to the state, please control our water uh, and, and do what you please. Uh, we feel it's important to continue to have local control. It's also important to understand and read through these studies and obtain the data uh, so that we can make wise decisions both on matters of the hitch, but also matters of future development and things of the kind. Uh, and I think that summarizes the rest and open for comments or questions. Okay. Well, I appreciate you both um, cooperating and collaborating on this and working with our staff. Um, it's exactly what we were asking for, and it's, um, it's fairly concise. Do we have any other questions or comments from the other board members? Yeah. Vice Chair Simon? Yeah, just coming on, and obviously this will be controversial, but I'm going to say it. Um, the hitch, I don't know if I can agree with removing the Upper Cache Creek watershed. Hitch were collected there. I mean, there's one of the oldest villages, which is now Anderson Marsh, Marsh State Park. It wasn't put there by the tribes because it was a neat place to be. It was because that was a gathering place. It was a place you collected the hitch. All those things that came together in that area. And to take the aspect that, well, we'll concentrate on the other ones, but not where the actual hitch were, because they went up all the tributaries, Upper Cache Creek, everywhere around the lake. Um, yeah, I thought the, the letter was really good, but excluding those, those areas, um, going to be a challenge because were any tribes involved in that conversation of taking the upper Peter Creek cache? The conversation was solely between water resources, uh, Supervisor Green, myself, and the water board. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's like a step backwards uh, from a tribal standpoint. Okay. Supervisor Green. Well, uh, I, I want to acknowledge that. It, it really kind of reflects the difficulty, uh, for example, of the Blue Ribbon Committee. We, you know, we, we talk about projects that may benefit the watershed generally, uh, Clear Lake generally, and of course, all those projects are important and, and would raise the fortunes of the Clear Lake Hitch. Uh, when, a pro, when applied with that broad brush. And, and uh, as it was proposed by the water boards, they did include uh, the Upper Cache Creek watershed and these other watersheds depicted on our map as comprising uh, a single hydrological unit that is defined in whatever the national database is of watersheds that define these regions. It, it makes sense from a basic jurisdictional standpoint that you would incorporate that single hydrological unit and include uh, the upper Cache Creek. Um, but even the state water board's map doesn't include the entirety of Lake County. It does exclude the northern uh, you know, forest lands. It does not extend as far south as uh, Middletown because that watershed is not directly uh, tied to the uh, uh, fortunes of the hitch. Uh, but I think that the single strongest thing that may argue for the exclusion is the fact that this is an emergency regulation uh, with a, a one-year sunset period by default unless they extend it. And having watched our uh, state and federal uh, partner agencies and the tribes uh, basically work so hard throughout this last year under the guise of the, the Clear Lake Hitch Task Force, which is led by California Department of Fish and Wildlife, there's this ongoing Clear Lake Hitch strategy agreement, which is being driven by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which continues to do its own analysis of whether this fish should be uh, listed as endangered on the, the Endangered Species Act. So there's plenty of work that continues to go on in all of our watersheds, including Upper Cache Creek, that are not uh, outlined in this emergency information order that the state water boards is doing. Uh, what the state water boards wants to find out is uh, where are the wells, uh, how many of them are there, uh, how many of them are closer to the watersheds, how many of them are farther out in the center of the, of the groundwater basins, is there any uh, d distinction to be made between them, what can we infer from the data we get there. So n knowing that long term, obviously, uh, hopefully, uh, all of our uh, streams and tributaries that are important to Clear Lake Hitch survival uh, will be incorporated in that longer term vision, knowing that we have a pretty short timeline and we do have limitations on staff resources, both at the state and the local levels, to dive into this. It seemed most prudent to focus on where the action is now and where the action is now, where the, where the current focus of study continues to be uh, most uh, acute is in is in the map that we show, uh, you know, Manning, Kelsey, Adobe, uh, Scotts, uh, Clover, uh, you know, Middle Creek, Manning Creek, all, all of these things that are the pri not the only streams of importance to hit survival, but the, the primary streams uh, of greatest interest right now. And uh, so, so that, was, that was the thought of it and, uh, you know, I'm interested to hear uh, what other people think of that proposed exclusion because uh, it wasn't something the state water boards came up with and I don't know uh, that the uh, State Farm Bureau took a position on that. So uh, I acknowledge your concerns. Certainly the uh, the path of least resistance would be follow the state water board's recommendation, but we think we will uh, allow greater focus in these areas of interest while reducing uh, potential uh, uh, opposition to the state water board's efforts in uh, those watershed lands that may be of less importance initially to Clear Lake Hitch recovery. Supervisor Sabatier. And I just want to respond to that. It's definitely an important creek, but it's a very different creek. Every other creek goes into the lake. This creek leaves the lake. And so this takes lake water. If the lake is at negative nine Rumsey, then we'll see huge problems in Cache Creek. But if it's at zero Rumsey to negative three to four Rumsey, there's still water within the creek. The other creeks are where the water flows have issues because they're only limited to what's above stream, not what's coming from the lake. And so it has a vastly different 
ecosystem in a sense than the other creeks that are flowing downhill into the lake versus coming out of the lake and then continuing its flow towards the Sacramento River Valley. So I, I think that's why it's seen as a different one, not to lessen the importance of it, just that the issues within that creek are completely different than the issues within the other creeks. Okay. Supervisor Crandall. Yeah, I, I hear, I hear all of that, and I just uh, wanted to comment on what uh, Supervisor Green said. Uh, I know that we want to focus on what's what, what's important right now. I know uh, that that's very important, but at the same time, there's going to come a time if we don't look at all aspects because um, I'm thinking of the Clear Lake Oaks area, where I think it's Shindle Creek. Um, I know it's been completely filled in to where there's there's uh, there's really no activity as much as there used to be, and so now it's not even considered. But you know, eventually, one of these other areas are going to be in the same situation because of the sediment. And so then, next will be well, we can only focus on what's important. So if it's just Kelsey Creek at that time, then we're focusing on that. Or if it's Scott, you know what I'm saying? Eventually, we're going to get to a point where, unless we figure out that sediment thing, and I'm not, I'm not trying to argue it. I'm just letting everyone know, like this. We're talking about all this other water studies and wells, and, and I'm like, the sediment's eventually going to put the hitch in a situation where, where are they really going to go? You know, so that's that's all I wanted to add. Uh, I really appreciate that comment, if only because there was like, this is concise, but there were like five paragraphs all about sedimentation that uh, didn't make the cutting room floor because of the sage editing advice uh, that was given. So I definitely agree, sedimentation. Uh, above and beyond the ongoing studies about TMDLs and phosphorus loading in the lake or what have you. The structural challenges in the creeks, both sedimentation, uh, gravel mining uh, damage, uh, you know, bridges, culverts, all that stuff. Again, already under study, so one reason uh, we kind of redacted that from this is we're already studying uh, structural challenges in all of the creeks uh, and sedimentation is being studied, although under the TMDL umbrella, at least we they know sedimentation Sedimentation is a big thing in the creeks, so that's not called out specifically in the regulation. And so uh, we didn't. We chose eventually to remove my uh, thoughtful comments on sedimentation from this letter uh, because it seems there's other more appropriate times and places to raise those concerns. Uh, but I totally hear what you're saying, and I totally support that. And not Supervisor Swatier. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, not to repeat exactly what was said, um, but yeah, it's about compartmentalizing what the information order is about. The information order is about extraction and diversion of water from the creeks. Absolutely, there's an issue with gravel and uh, uh, nutrient load that eventually blocks up the creeks. Fish and Wildlife just did that presentation about some of the work that they're doing. Let's make sure to keep doing that work, but this is specific to water flow. Um, through uh, the impact of extraction of groundwater and diversion. So that's why it was compartmentalized to just that. So I'm curious if there are other concerns with the letter. See, so we had a public comment, right? Yep. We had a public comment on adding in the voluntary action section. I'll have to, I'll jump back it's here. The, it's the, um, one of the last paragraphs. Yeah, I and we, are, should we go to public comment? Oh yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess so. Okay, I, I was just, just, it was here, it was being. Yeah, I, sure, we've I, got some public comment, we've got some people in the room. I am just I wondering, we've had this conversation about the, you know, designating what part of the watershed, and I'm wondering if the other points, um, if there are issues with the other points. Supervisor Crandall, did you have any? Did you? No. Okay. Let's open it up for public comment. Um, we'll start with the people in the room. Do we have anyone coming up for comment? Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Harper. I'm the executive director for Lake County Farm Bureau. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, first of all, Moak, you know, made, made a point, and this might be an interesting uh, sentiment to respond to that with, but to me, 
And from a Farm Bureau perspective, I, I don't necessarily see why there would be any reason to exclude the Upper Cache Creek portion of the watershed. And additionally, I think that excluding it may only confirm suspicion that some of these regulations are directed towards agriculture. You know, that area has a less prominent agricultural landscape than this area does. And so by excluding that, I don't know how that looks from an optics perspective, but that's the way that I would perceive it. So I might offer that for consideration as well when it, if you decide on uh, either including that or removing that from the letter. Um, additionally, I think otherwise this letter is very well written and presents some strong points. I think that it's very important to keep control locally over anything. Um, when, when you give up that control, you have nothing, and it spirals very quickly. And it's really hard for me to stand up here today and think back on months ago in February when we had this discussion, and there was some strong opposition to authoring the emergency proclamation for those reasons exactly. And so it, it's, it's hard for me because of that reason, just that we're in this position and that there's an opportunity for state entities to have more control over our local resources than we do. But um, otherwise, Farm Bureau, I think, supports this letter with the exception to the Upper Cache Creek comments, which I'm not really partial to it either way. That's just my perception of, of removing that. So thank you. Thank you. We have anyone else in the chambers wishing to give a comment? No? Do we have anyone in the Zoom room? Any hands up? No. no. Okay. Okay. We do have um, public comment that was submitted earlier um, this afternoon. I'll just read it since it came to the board late. It's um, from Planning Commissioner uh, Miley Field. She said, thank you for considering this letter to the State Water Board. I ask you to clarify for consider, clarify, I ask you for clarity to consider adding the words agricultural users in the second to last paragraph. So the final verbiage is we oppose opposition of fines and enforcement actions on agricultural users, individuals, and sing single family residences during the implementation of the emergency regulations. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Even if authorized. The agriculture community is very upset that the tribes are not focusing on the real issues, predation, and water quality. Many members of the ag community assist in the relocation of stranded hitch in the spring, and this feels like a slap in the face. If the board's action leads to restrictions on water use during frost season or at any other time, the results will completely devastate all agriculture in the watershed. Thank you, Miley Field Organic Pear Grower, Kelseyville. Supervisor Sabatier? Um, I think that the idea behind the way it's phrased currently was to kind of cover everybody. Obviously, people are going to feel left out. So wh wh why don't we look at maybe changing it to actions on property owners? during implementation of the emergency regulations. That way it covers everybody. We don't have to identify specific who. Um, that way it covers single family residences because there's, there's, there's not just single, there's vacant lots. There's, um, I just think property owners um, would cover that and I'm okay with that change. Supervisor Green. Well, I mean, with that change, it would basically say adopt the fines, but don't use them. And I don't know that that's super helpful. Uh, the nuance that we attempted to introduce was clearly a domestic water user that just has a, you know, a home supply well versus a larger agricultural operation that may have multiple wells, multiple properties. Um, so to the extent there is concern about uh, the burden of, of whatever reporting requirements the state water board is going to go and and 
the way they're phrased uh, broadly in the emergency regulations. They do want to find out about well locations. Uh, there's plenty of people that don't have any good information on the wells on their own property, especially if they bought the property recently. There are plenty of long-term residents uh, who may not have complete understanding uh, of the wells or flows or levels or, or the information that the water board is going to be requesting. Uh, I do want to highlight that to the extent there are local control or some concern about restrictions, uh, this is very carefully phrased. This is an information order that applies to information only. They want information from us, uh, but they aren't proposing any type of limitations or management actions uh, or anything of that nature that would be uh, predicated by this data. Because again, we don't know what we don't know. So. Uh, we could add agricultural users, we could add you know, small water systems, we could add domestic and all that. The, the, the original wording was just basically to say uh, not all water users are created equal, so the smallest of the small, those single family residences, those that are on domestic supply wells only, seemed like a fairly uh, low hanging fruit to urge the state water boards to show discretion. Uh, on fines, but I'm basically okay with any word change because I still expect them to show that discretion uh, even if we ask for a broader uh, exemption. So I, I guess I'm not clear. Was this an inadvertent omission or was this intent with leaving the ag users out? I will say that we had two different perspectives on the way we read that section. I, I did not, when I see individuals, I thought that covered everybody and then single family uh, residences means that it's a residence on there. Uh, so I hear- some, some property owners are corporations, for example. Okay, so it was your intent to limit or was this a- No, I, I did not even ask the question. I assumed that I knew that in reading it that it covered all in the idea of let's work together rather than having to enforce fines. And your intent or interpretation? W was more focused on individuals and, and residences. Uh, I think the scope of what they're asking for, especially for larger uh, ag operations, um, you know, to the extent that, to the extent this information or order is gonna be effective and that some people may be needed to be nudged toward compliance. And again, nobody likes the scary letters with the fine language on it, but um, that's, that's how they do their things. They do out, put out the request for information. They do uh, look to voluntary actions. Uh, they do envision and encourage the possibility of third-party compliance tools to help with reporting. Uh, and those may be helpful to uh, both larger outfits and smaller uh, residential users. But I, I, I distinguish in my own mind between a small residential uh, person uh, on a single domestic well and uh, larger, uh, larger land uses and larger companies um, that use water. And so uh, to the extent that we want to ask for uh, not a free pass from the state water boards, but to apply some discretion, I, I, I focused on the smaller uh, you know, domestic water user, but if there's not consensus to do that. Uh, you know, we can certainly change the wording or strike the paragraph. Um, and uh, before we're done digesting it, I'm also open to the idea that we would bring Upper Cache Creek back in, but I did want to loop in water resources staff to make sure um, that uh, we uh, correctly uh, identified uh, some potential geographic limitation and scope that would potentially make their job easier, even though this is a state water board reg. Um, so I don't want to. I don't want to make a, a change on the geographic scope without uh, at least offering uh, the opportunity for water resources to chime in. Do we have Director De Leon? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, while I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to chime in. Um, I think we're going to have to live with whatever the state decides here. And, um, uh, I don't, I don't think it's really, uh, going to impact our department, um, significantly one way or the other. I think we've got a bit of work ahead of us. Um, 
and and I I I I appreciate all the comments uh, that everyone's made today, and this is a really difficult issue. Um, but I I uh, we'll do whatever the board decides, and and uh, we'll we'll adjust. So I don't I I I apologize for really not having any substantive uh, comment here, but. Uh, we'll we'll do whatever uh, the board decides, and and frankly, whatever the state decides, we'll we'll adjust to that. Uh, thank you, Director DeLeon, and thank you again so much for your hard work last week. Uh, if you were not our public works director, you would be a mean editor, and uh, I appreciate the, I appreciate your candor. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We have any other comments? Made my comment. You made your comment, and Supervisor Crandall. In one aspect, I'm still trying to figure out who determines what real issues are <laughs> on the public comment. Real issues or real users? Yeah. Well, let's see. Is it any user? No, it was. Uh, <clears throat> oh. The agricultural community is very upset that the tribes are not focusing on the real issues. Oh, it that. determines the mm -hmm. real issues. I mean, because in every different aspect or every different entity in the community is going to think of their issues as the real issue. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. that's all. But um, are you asking me if I agree with changes, the changes like the Upper Cache Creek Basin? Or is that where you're Well, asking? let's start with that. I made my comment. I'd you like made your, to, yeah. Like it added back in. Uh, at this point, obviously, I did not take it from the uh, agricultural uh, conversation, but I thought that was a very good point made here at the, you know, um, taking it from that point. But, um, and I'll go to the other issue, adding the agricultural community on the, on the fines. I, I'm, I'm okay with that comment because what we are looking to do, and, and it is right, the state's going to make a decision that needs to be made. But I think we have always, at least my intention going in this, is working together. I said it last time they were here. I saw a 10-suggestion 10 10 way of how we could change some things with the hitch and other stuff from the agriculture on the Farm Bureau when it came through in these conversations. And I think we continue working in that direction. So adding for that request to, to say agricultural users should be added to that second paragraph where it was suggested. So those are my thoughts. Right, so, and did you have something to add? No, I just want to see if I can loop this together. It's a, it sounds like we're uh, building toward consensus that um, on the first page of the draft letter. I was under about the to give my comment, so. All right, thank do you. Do you have a comment or you, okay, thank you. Um, I don't see a clear reason why we should change the watershed. I think we want to well, obviously, we want to keep and maintain as much local control as possible, but we also want to be um, very even with all of our residents and businesses and users um, and tribes and move forward together as well as we possibly can. And so I think if we're uh, picking and choosing water users and we're dividing up the watershed, we're not going to accomplish that. And so I do agree with um, Vice Chair Simon that we keep the same watershed map and that um, we are more inclusive in our language with the water users. We can either say all water users, um, I, th I think we should say all water users or all property owners. Well, I don't know, is property owners, do we have water users that aren't property owners? So then all water users. Yeah. And I'm okay with the language that was. Microphone. I'm okay with the language that was proposed by adding the um, agricultural users, individuals, and single-family residents. I don't know if water users covers more. Well, are we, are we missing people then if we just keep adding words in, or should we be more broad in and our I'm, definition? And I'm fine with either or. Um, my, my goal in walking into this, into the meeting with the water board and all, was to minimize asking people who do not need to have an impact from this. So if you're five miles away from a creek, it didn't make sense to me for you to have to receive an information order versus if you're within that 750 feet. 
um, especially we know how segmented our um, our um, groundwater basins are that you could be 200 feet that way you're drinking from a different basin and so the idea that it was so broad this is why we came back with the 750 feet but all of the creeks feed the lake there's one creek that exits the lake and it's not based on if 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 there's a draw from those creeks it would pull water out of the lake there's and i'm, I'm just going to say it yes this is this is very much from the water board perspective being aimed at the heaviest potential water users so they are looking at agriculture uh, which is why the uh, water board was stating that they are in not in favor but they were definitely thinking of looking at getting rid of the uh, upper cash creek um, if there is no water in cash creek that means we have a problem in our lake and it's a whole bigger problem um, i i just I see it very differently as far as it goes. Making my argument, I'm ready to move forward, um, but I just think it's a, it, water flows in one direction, from the creeks to the lakes, out Cache to the lakes, to the lake, out Cache Creek, um, not from Cache Creek into the lake and out somewhere else. And so it's a vastly different um, situation in that way. Well, we do have <coughs> other creeks flowing into the lake that are excluded into into the Oaks Arm. There, there's other creeks here. It's not just Cache Creek. And I think From I think comparing the two maps. I think the other creeks, and I don't have the terminology. Supervisor Green, uh, the creeks that are only active during um, like a flash flood or during a heavy rain, and then within a matter of a week or so, they're back to being dry. Right. Ephemeral, they're not, yeah. no, they're not highlighted Eph ephemeral, as, yeah. the, as the priority streams. Yeah, right. And within the uh, letter, it requests that we do not look at those creeks um, or the wells nearby of those creeks for the fact that they're not long-lasting enough that runs should be seen. So if we're only looking at 750 feet from these primary streams, does it matter then? And again, we limit my, the watershed. like I stated, my goal was to limit the ask to those that should be asked versus those that shouldn't be bothered by something that is asking them to do something more. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, there's also the how do you provide the data, uh, what devices. There was no answer from the water board if they're going to be paying for these. Most likely they will not. And so as a property owner, you're going to have to take on the uh, the burden of making sure that you purchase these devices to be able to either meter or uh, read the levels of your well and provide that data. Um, it's not a extreme burden, but again, in my opinion, if there's no need to ask those individuals, then let's not add an extra burden for an extra cost on top of everything else that is already costing more for every individual in our community. Um, again, I'm ready to move forward. I, make, I just made my argument and uh, I think it has logic to it, but that's just me. Okay. Do we have any further comments? Supervisor Green? Yeah, it, not really a comment, trying to get this across the finish line. So I'm, uh, if I'm keeping score, it seems like there's consensus that on page one of the draft letter under geographic scope, we would just strike that entire section. It sounds like there's interest on page two. Uh, oh, and if we strike a geographic scope on the first page, we would obviously strike the map uh, that is currently on page three. And then under voluntary actions, uh, we could change that one sentence of interest, oppose imposition of fines or enforcement actions on, how about uh, agricultural operations and single family residences? I think that's still limiting users that we might not be thinking about at the moment. Uh, the other type of users, for example, uh, under the duplicative efforts section, there are community water systems that would be covered by this. We've already stated that uh, we don't think um, any additional reporting above and beyond what they already do is necessary. Um, there are public water systems that will be covered by this. Uh, uh, again, um, not all wells are created equal, so some are domestic only, some are ag domestic, and, and so uh, what wording would you 
uh, just all water uses basically is an ask to don't fine anybody regardless of their status. So I, I think we're trying to differentiate that, uh, for example, uh, you know, property owners which are single family residences uh, are a distinct case. Agricultural operations are a distinct case. But if we just... I thought we settled on water users. Water users? Water users? Yeah. So enforcement actions on water users, period? Not period, but... Just that single phrase? I think that's what the consensus was. Um, but can I argue for the geographic scope? You said eliminate that whole thing. I'd like to make sure we keep the last paragraph. If there are changes are going to be made, I'd like to keep the last paragraph and just say within the watershed. Um. So would you say within the watersheds, the regulations should be narrowly tailored? Yes, because uh, here we say we oppose the regulation to require reporting of water usage of well locations on near eph ephemeral uh, water courses, which are the ones that are just there for kind of flash flood use more so than as actual creeks that have long lasting water. Um. Could we tie that under the next heading, spatial and temporal data? That works Kind of an introduction? Me. That works for me. All right. So the fix would be strike the heading geographic scope, the first two paragraphs in that section, move the remaining paragraph minus the introductory clause, uh, starting with the regulations should be narrow, narrowly tailored and put that paragraph under the heading spatial and temporal data, uh, and the rest of it would flow after that. I'm good with that. Their consensus for that all right yes and then on that last sentence it was just water users not not individuals not agribusiness not single-family residences so I think that's a pretty good laundry list of recommended changes mm -hmm. I hope somebody's writing it down <laughs> did you get it Lloyd Yes, and um, just for clarification, any changes to the attachments to the map? Deleted. Even? Yeah. Deleted. Remove the map. All right. And the only reference to the map was removed as well, so. Okay. Um, it looks like if there's consensus to do all that, uh, then if we're ready for a motion. Yes. Uh, sitting as the Board of Directors for the Lake County Watershed Protection District, I move to approve the draft comment letter to the State Water Boards as amended and authorize the Chair to sign. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. That is the end of our open session items. So we will move into closed session. We have two remaining items left. 8.1, conference with real property negotiators pursuant to government code section 54956.8, property APN 024-083-06-5245, Third Street, Kelseyville, California, negotiating parties, A, county negotiators, Susan Parker, Stephen Carter, and B, Carlene Ellis and Lorna Sue Sides under negotiations term of payment. And 8.2, conference with labor negotiator, A, county negotiators, S. Parker, P. Samick, and Rob Howe, and B, employee organizations, LCDSA and LCCOA. And we will go now go into closed session. Okay. All right, welcome back. Was there any action taken out of closed session? No, no action to be taken out of closed session. Well, meeting adjourned.